And oh boy, what a week it was. And I will tell you, tell you this, it's probably, it's a generational thing. And uh, of course, I've learned a lot, by, uh, well, by hanging out with Bo with Generation Z and the millennials and everything else. Nobody likes to be the old guy or what have you. But it's such a generational thing when you think about it, going to work when you're sick. And I know there are a lot of people that go to work when they're coughing and wheezing. And, and I've put you through the last week of it. And I want to thank my friend Jeremy, my medical provider, for finally listening and going, Hey, Kevin Miller, are you ever going to call me and get some medicine? And we are. And this is one of those things that I say as a public service announcement. Don't live your life like Kevin Miller. Kevin Miller, uh, when he was in college for a very brief time and uh, worked my way through college, uh, worked a really good job. Uh, working at a mall. You might not know what a mall is, but all you have to do, do is go to a, um, go to Google or Wikipedia and find out what a mall is. Or you can go to Boise Town Square Mall. No, we don't own the mall, but if we did, uh, you believe me, we would have the studio at the mall and we'd be right at the food court because that would fit my physique. However, um, I, w- I worked, at, I went to college during the day and scrubbed floors and did all sorts of goofy things at night at the mall. And if you think to yourself, the mall, yeah, the mall, the freaks come out at night and then you got the militant mall walkers, all sorts of crazy things at the mall. And when I was in New Hampshire, um, starting this great career, this dream that's almost 30 years old, I, I worked at a mall and working at a mall was great. It was fun. It was outstanding. It was, it was cool because I could, do my show during the morning and then come in and work at the mall. And then I thought that I was too big time and, you know, uh, it was beneath me to work at the mall if I were going to be taken seriously as a journalist or as a commentator or whatever. And so I quit the mall and whatever. But uh, you're, you're always taught, and especially when you don't have insurance, there is something that you, you don't want to go to the doctor. You think it's a waste of time. And again, I think it's a generational thing. And we were always taught that you go in no matter what. And for the last week and a half, I've been coughing and uh, hacking up and all sorts of things. And I want to thank again, I don't know if Jeremy's up this early, but he does listen, that said, hey, dude, uh, I think you need some cough medicine. I think you need this. I think you need that. And lo and behold, um, doing that and not traveling and not being in strange places with strange people like the United Nations, we are on the road to recovery. And we are back here at the Palatial Broadcast Center. And lo and behold, it's a little early, but the computer seems to be working. So we are very uh, fortunate to do that. And I, I, I guess what the, the point I'm trying to make is, and we learn this through the pandemic, we learn this through everything else, you know, take care of yourself. You know, we take our health for granted. I know certainly my entire life I've taken my health for granted and made a lot of unhealthy choices. And the older you get, the more that comes back to, to haunt you. This Reverend Wright would like to say the chickens are coming home to roost and nobody likes it when the chickens are coming home to roost, uh, regardless of who you are or where you are in this country. America's chickens are coming home to roost. Yeah, we never like it when the chickens are coming home to roost. So it is so good to be back here uh, in the state of Idaho. It's so good to be with you. We're going to talk about our trip to New York. We're going to talk about everything else. And you're going to go, Kevin Miller, you were here on Friday. Yeah, I was at the remote broadcast center, my house. But I will uh, have to say that um, the older I get, the more affirmation means so much to me. My dad will go, ah, you don't need that. Get a cup of Maxwell House coffee and go to work like I did. I understand that, Dad. But on the other hand, making people feel appreciated is is something that I try to do very much. And I like to let you in on what goes on behind the scenes. I do want to thank our coworker, Holly, who donated a bunch of vases for the Mrs. Miller Vase Company. Uh, Bo's, Bo came into the room, and, it, you know, if you have an office or what have you, and all of a sudden you see something disturbed, and you're going, what are all these vases doing in my room? See, Bo has become the auxiliary of the Mrs. Miller business. And then I come into this room, and like I said, nobody likes to be called the Susan Lucci of radio. Nobody likes to be the guy that doesn't get it done. Nobody likes to be the guy that doesn't get the big gold. And so you, you have your own doubts. So I'm walking down the hallway of the Palatial Broadcast Center, and I look into the studio. I don't know, what are we, in the George C. Armstrong building. And I, I see, again, for the second year in a row, I want to thank uh, Betsy Boland and maybe the, the duck lady as well. I Just a room filled with balloons and flyers and all sorts of things. 
they don't have the picture of me as the best radio host ever. I guess that went out this year, but uh, I really do appreciate the sentiment. And I don't do a good enough job of that if you're like me. You know what I'm talking about when I want to thank my coworkers here at KIDO Talk Radio for um, for this nice gesture. And I know balloons. I know the cost of balloons, having done some uh, consulting work with Mrs. Miller's Enterprises. So I know this isn't cheap. So thank you very much to my coworkers for that. Uh, the sound clip of the day before we get to your calls at 580-5436, 580-KIDO. Bo, this is worth you listening to this. Here we go. This is J.D. Vance. Um, really saying what we all say during Sunday shows. The incidents were limited to a handful of apartment complex, uh, apartment complexes, and the mayor said our dedicated police officers have acted on those concerns. A handful of problems. Only, Martha, do you hear yourself? Only a handful of apartment complexes in America were taken over by Venezuelan gangs, and Donald Trump is the problem, and not Kamala Harris's open border. Americans are so fed up with what's going on, and they have every right to be. And I, I really find this exchange, Martha, sort of interesting because you seem to be more focused with nitpicking everything that Donald Trump has said, rather than acknowledging that apartment complexes in the United States of America America are being taken over by violent gangs. Here we have it. This is J.D. Vance on the liberal show this week with ABC News. And look, Martha Raddatz, you can't question her determination, her bravery. But we're talking about Aurora, Colorado, where you have the Venezuelan gangs taking over apartment complexes. And J.D. Vance saying what we all said. Can you replay that one more time, Sweet William? The incidents were limited to a handful of apartment com- a handful of apartment complexes in america and i love what jd vance says are you listening to yourself lady Polly, good morning you're on with kevin miller on kido talk radio hello Polly. good morning to you kev good morning yeah, going to the doctor for me was kind of a pleasant experience my father was one so when i had to get to see a specialist or so he thought because he was a gp my dad was a gp internal medicine he would he would just send me out to one of his colleagues and you know i had the best of service so i was pretty fortunate there but But, you know uh, that was back when going to the doctor wasn't like going to a factory you ever notice that today that you know you take a number and and by the way (laughs) wherever you live this is the thing that really blanks me off the most uh can i see your insurance card hey man (coughs) i got a cough yeah, I need to see your insurance card. I need that deductible. That'll be a hundred dollars, please. Huh? That, that, that's the worst thing about going to the doctor these days. Now, I also I also worked with a mall. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is back to you. I thought this was about me. Please go ahead, young man. <laughs> no, I want to hear about what did they say about your cough. He said, "Here's some cough Please. syrup, and here's some." Uh, I was going to say some antiseptic, but uh, antibiotic. Yeah, that show with uh, with Martha Raddatz. I mean, can you believe that? Did. It's only a few yeah. buildings taken yeah. over by the illegals. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Nothing to see here. Just keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, I think there's five liberals in the, in the round table, including the moderator, which is usually jo- Jonathan Carl. Well, and, and, but here's the other and, thing. Uh, and whatever happened to men on TV? We got emasculated. <laughs> there's, there's, right, but the ones that there are no men on. And I'm going, you know, maybe I, I grew up with David Brinkley. Maybe I grew up with whomever else. Uh, I was watching this documentary on Mike Wallace where it was all guys. And I'm going, what happened to the guys in, in media? There was a takeover. <laughs> a coup. I think Nancy Pelosi got in there and had a coup back there in the late sixties, early seventies. <laughs> I would I would agree with you. So uh, back to you, Paula. You were working at a mall, and I'm were, working with a mall. You were working with the mall, and you were picking up girls. And... Yeah, that's how we heated our house too. At the same time, it was too hot. It was just too expensive to heat the house with a with a, uh, a fire blast furnace. It just it was just it was way too expensive. It was a a house that was built during the Great Depression for a man that had six kids. And uh, so we we had the room that we needed because we had six kids, but 
the furnace that they had in there was a dinosaur, and it just it cough out smoke just about the same time that you might feel a wisp of warm air. And uh, so we we heated our house with with coast coast live oak is what it was called, and yeah. uh, Monterey pine. And uh, I don't know where we've gotten this. We went from my experience as a young, exciting ma- uh, mall maintenance guy. And by the lady goes housekeeping. No, I'm not housekeeping. It's mall maintenance. Housekeeping, spill on the food court. Are you kidding me? Uh, to you talking well, about wood one. back in the day, yes. Here's one for you before I go. go oh, you're leaving. Air. Yes, you're leaving us. <laughs> well, you're going you're gonna to pull the plug. Just, Polly? Joseph, Joseph Go, Goebbels. Oh, boy. You, you, you say Joseph Goebbels. 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 Yeah. Yeah, he, uh... <laughs> this is not going about, well, Paul. Uh, you could say this about Jonathan Carl. Oh, my gosh. But, uh, Polly? He, he, Caller? He graduated from the <laughs> Joseph Goebbels School of Journalism. And you could add that to everybody else that's in so-called journalism wow. today that you see on TV. Well, Paul, we're all liars. Well, we're paid to lie. We we appreciate that uh, outreach to the journalist you. community. You're a yes. radio man. I'm a, I'm something. I don't know. I'm a, I'm the guy. They go. There goes the guy that can't win the big one. And they no, go. Look no, at that guy. There's the guy. There's the fatty. He can't win the big one. And I go. Okay, well, Who are you talking about? Where? Where's the fat? Oh, I'm the fatty that can't win the big one. Did you get a trophy like everybody else? Is no, I was. I go, hey guys, what about me? I've been here more years than anybody else. They go, uh, sweaty man, go in the back again, again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad, really. Yeah, sure it isn't. Yeah. Well, I didn't get a trophy for coming in second in a golf tournament. Big deal. Uh, yeah, so thank, th- yeah, hold on. Th- yeah, yeah, thank you, Paulie. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing personal about a golf tournament, but this is the very best of our beloved radio. And you're talking about a golf tournament. That's why I love you, Paulie. We love you all. Phone numbers here: five eight zero five four three six five eight zero K I K I D O. How about JD Vance? This though this guy is not laying down, and here we have the journalists. That are coming out and going, oh, it's uh, the illegals. It's not so bad. Here is an interview from the New York Times. Really think this is necessary. You have to deport a large number of, of people. There are way too many illegal aliens in this country. You have to reestablish some deterrence and law enforcement for people coming here illegally. Uh, I think it's certainly reasonable to deport around a million people per year in the United States of America. Now, of course, we have 25 million. So. Uh, that would take a long time, 25 years, if my math is is correct. But again, I don't think that you have to deport everybody because if you reestablish some semblance of a reasonable border policy, a lot of those people are going to go home willingly. If you make it harder for American companies to undercut the wages of American workers by hiring illegal labor, a lot of those folks are going to go home. President Trump and I really think this is necessary. You have to deport a large number. You know, and he is so right about that. Get rid of the incentives Get rid of the incentives to hire the illegals. And once again, you're going to have American workers. Of course, we've seen this when it comes to technology. We don't want to hire an American because we have to pay an American a living wage. And, you know, what do you tell your kids? What do you tell your really smart kids when it, when, when, when we're talking about what type of career to go into? One of the best is engineering, right? If you go to Georgia Tech or Stanford or, um, you know, Princeton or wherever else, you're going to, you know, you're always going to have a job. You're going to, you're going to be able to, to do things. And, and yet all of a sudden we've had people here that are great engineers that have been replaced because of what? They've been replaced because you can hire somebody from India. You can hire somebody from Pakistan. You can hire somebody from anywhere uh, around the world. Bring them in. And guess what? They will take your job. And they will do it for less money, no benefits. And if they look at the employer the wrong way, they get the boot. So why in the world would you hire an American? 
Why would we incentivize companies by giving them incentives and tax breaks not to hire Americans? Pat Buchanan brought this up in the early 90s. Ross Perot brought this up in the mid-90s. They were called xenophobic, racist, you name it. But they were correct. And say what you want about Donald John Trump. He's the only guy that has ever been able to break through the liberal, sneaky, freaky brother liberals that have decided to destroy the United States of America. And we're talking about your kids, your grandkids, your brothers, everybody. Everybody. When we're looking at this issue. And to me, uh, it's just crazy. And the only people that are bringing this up, I remember during the Barack Obama administration, you remember that? Thanks, Obama. Barack Obama, Mr. Wonderful, hey, the brothers... Uh, you don't like Kamala because you're a uh, misogynist or whatever he said. Remember that guy? Yeah, what about his economy when he sent everything to China? I can remember on this program, thank you, KIDO Talk Radio, for keeping me employed during Obama, when Barack Obama was giving tax breaks to Westinghouse to send jobs to China. We ain't sending jobs to China. By the way, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Are you or someone you know struggling with hearing loss? Hey, it's your old friend, Kevin Miller, with a quick question from Hearing Connection. Actually, it's not a question. It's a message. Don't wait any longer to help yourself and to get the help you need. If left untreated, it can lead to social isolation and depression. We're talking about hearing loss and even lead to an increased risk of developing dementia, which is never a good thing. Hearing Connection is now offering a 30-day risk-free trial of the latest and greatest hearing aids, the Signia AX. Don't let hearing loss hold you back any longer. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that when you're... You're tuned into a show and then somebody talks and you're like, hey, and you're thinking to yourself, that never used to happen before. Well, it won't happen when you get your hearing checked and you get the help that you need. I know how it is. You go, I don't want any help. Why not? Why not make your life easier? Call now for a free hearing evaluation and a risk-free trial of the new Signa AX, 208-488-3255 today and start enjoying life to the fullest again. That's Hearing Connection, 208-488-3255 We love it when you crank up the Kevin Miller program, but maybe some people don't. And you won't have to because you'll have the hearing that you need from our friends at Hearing Connection. And let me just point out that Hearing Connection has supported this program for many, many years. Uh, And like I said, the people that advertise on this program, I don't give them enough credit. But uh, they're the ones that keep us rolling because they actually believe in us. And we want to thank them for that. We ask you that you humbly support them. Uh, coming up next, J.D. Vance. Uh, what, what, you know, would, if you lived in Boise, and I hear this is going on in Boise, you know, some other places. I mean, you have people that don't speak the language that are taking over apartment complexes. Is that okay with you? The old-fashioned way. By the way, if you ever want to find out what we do, the life of adventure we lead, it's always at Kevin Miller Show on social media. You can always uh, check us out through the website, through the apps. Uh, my brother lives in a very nice suburban area of Cook County, Chicago. Kevin, did you know they have freight trains that run through his neighborhood and gangs will bust into the freight trains to see what's in them? If something's good, they'll throw it off the train, depending on the amount of loot. They will go to the closest neighborhood and steal cars, trucks, SUVs to take the loot away. Unfortunately, one day while stealing a truck from a house, a teenage daughter was home sick from school. The gang members really raped her, then blew her brains out. This has been going on for over a decade from the dark side of the moon Chandler. Well... That's why you don't live in Chicago, unfortunately. Uh, let's get you to work safely and on time. Then we're going to talk to Hank. Ah, it's so good to be home. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Kevin. From the G&G Installation Studio, working an injury accident on the freeway right near the Broadway interchange. Watch for that traffic beginning and back up. Another accident working near 10 Mile and right near milepost 32. We have a vehicle with a broken axle. Direct orthopedic kit for sprains, strains, and breaks. Skip the ER and go directly to Doc. Drop in without an appointment to one of five Treasure Valley locations. Visit BoiseDoc.com to learn more. That's your traffic. Now, I'm Dave Burnett on KIDO. And uh, too bad we, you can't listen to the exclusive live stream that doesn't exist as Bo and I are going back and forth about Oregon winning, Boise State winning. Of course, many of you listening probably wouldn't feel that's very compelling anyway. However, back to the sauce. We go to Hank, who joins us now on a potpourri Monday 
with Kevin Miller on KIDO Talk Radio. Good morning, Hank. Good morning. Uh, before I get to my main topic, did you how did you do on the Marconi Awards? I, I've well, kind of called in, so I don't know. Actually, Hank, I've been talking about this for 17 days. Uh, I guess you're not listening. Go, gosh. Well, We're, evidently, I heard it kind of ended that while I kind of work, work well. No, it's okay, Hank. Okay. Okay, Hank, can I tell you, I'm a loser. Okay. Well, here's my point. Wait a minute. Aren't you going to console me? Or, first of all, you don't listen. You want to talk about your point. And I'm saying this, Hank, as you know, because I love you. So please don't take it personally. And then you, you get me to out myself that I'm a loser okay, again. I'm and then, sorry. I'm, so, I'm, Hank, sorry. It's I'm a, sorry. Hank, it's okay. It's okay. You're going to get to your point in two seconds, okay? okay? And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like a, a side order of fries. But back to you and uh, and what you'd like to talk about, sir. Well, the fact is, if, if Trump tries to deport these people, as you mentioned just earlier, the Democrats are going to tie this up in, in litigation, all the, all the left-wing groups, the Democrat Party, any, anything. What's at stake in this for the Democrats is permanent power. It's very much like on the model of the Social Revolutionary Party of Mexico, permanent power. These people are a godsend from their standpoint. And if, they, if people get killed or maimed or whatever, that's collateral damage because it's all to the good of the Democrat Party. Because people who, who can't speak the language, don't have skills, are going to be dependent on government and largesse. They're sure votes for the Democrats. This is what this is all about. And if it ruins the country, that's fine, because the Democrats will be in charge. So, so I mean, this is the morality of, of, of the modern-day Democrat Party that we face. And, and if they have to, besides litigation, they'll probably have big, massive riots across the country. Uh, organized, you know, and you'll probably have your usual cast of characters, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, the whole... Hank, uh, whole that's not very optimistic for a Monday morning. Well, I'm just telling you the reality. That's what they're prepared to do if if if, if, if Trump Trump wins and if Trump attempts to... They're going to resist with all their power, both in the courts and you know, on the streets. And this is going to be the tactics because it's all... Because what's at stake here for the Democrat Party and in, in what they see, what they're salivating on is, that, is the fact that the party will be in total, total continuous power. There'll be no chance for the Republicans because they'll have this, all the all the key states will flood it with immigrants voting that they'll tip the balance on any any, keep, uh, keep, uh, any elections. So so that's, the, that's just the whole point of the whole game. And the sooner people realize what the Democrat Party is all about, the better off it will be. All this crap about caring about people, they don't care about people. They don't care about the people that are raped, killed by, by, the, by these gangs like the Venezuelans or whatever, because these Venezuelans and these people are potential votes for the Democrat Party. Why do you think the Democrats enlist, go to the penitentiaries and the jails uh, to, to, to register voters and in, in, in to felons because felons are the highest number of vote, uh, sure votes, 97% for the Democrat Party. They don't care if a guy's a felon or but as long as they vote Democrat, they're, they're, they're good. Well, thank you for that uplifting uh, message, Hank. Well, maybe not uplifting, but it's reality. I disagree then, with you. Guys, I disagree with you. I don't think that we're going to have that type of riots in the streets. I, 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 I hope you're wrong. I hope I'm wrong too. I hope that I'm, I hope I'm also wrong on the litigation thing, the litigation thing that the Democrats act reasonably, but that's asking a lot for them to, to act reasonably because it's, it's like somebody, it's like, uh, somebody who's, who's suddenly decided to, 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 I mean, decided to get gold. I mean, it's, and, and, and you're going to be rich forever. It's like the draw to the Democrats. We're going to be in power forever for this. I mean, it's it's it power power like money is intoxicating, and uh, this is what it's all about. And uh, I, and they're going to fight. To, they're going to fight like hell to keep it. So, all right, sure all, all right, Hank. Thank you for the call. Uh, we sure, sure hope you're wrong. Don't forget our friends at Beacon Plumbing. Stop freaking call Beacon today. They bring you Fox News on your home for Fox News. That's KIDO Talk Radio. K I D O. Sydney Page and our great friend Rance, who redecorated the Palatial Broadcast Center, uh, bringing back, well, not the Marconi, but just Kevin Miller. So we appreciate everybody who spent their money to decorate this place. This is uh, 
And as many of you may or may not know, I'm kind of a hoarder. So the balloons, I'll keep the balloons up here till they, they go bad. Patriot Ray joins us now. Good morning. You're on KIDO Talk Radio. Hello, Patriot Ray. Good morning, brother. Um, we're glad you're back in town. Glad to be back. Um, you know, President Trump he has a solution for how to, how to deport many of these illegals. All you have to do, and it would be thousands, if not millions, cut off all funding to them. Make them earn what they want instead of handing it out to them. Uh, you would get, the, get them to self-deport on their own. So that's one solution. The other solution is that you don't call to anybody that is not here legally. Come here legally. We would be more than happy to help you out, do what you can. But it used to be you had to have a sponsor who would help you get over some of the humps so that you could um, take care of yourself. And you had the promises. That's what you wanted to do. You didn't want the government to take care of you. So here we've got solutions, but the Republic or the Democrats always say, oh, no one on the Demo- Republican side has any solutions at all when we do have solutions. So let's move forward. We're sure grateful to have you back, and you'll always be the Marconi Award winner for us. And we're always grateful to have you here because of the things that you do accomplish. Uh, Take the Boise mission, for example. When you have the mission for each week, twice a year, what you do is phenomenal. And the people that give in this area are phenomenal. So we're praying for you to continue to keep up the good work and to not give up one iota of what you really feel in your heart. We are grateful for that. So. You just have a wonderful day. Stay fired up. I know that irritates Liberal Steve, but, you know, I love Liberal Steve. I don't love his uh, philosophies on things and his ideals of what he thinks is the perfect world. We need to stand up for America. If you are a true American, not a Asian American, African American, but American, and love your heritage, if whatever country you're from, that's okay, but... You came here to get a better life, so you are an American or you're not. So God bless. Have a great day. Sure, grateful to have you back in the area where we can have the truth spilled out to the people who, if they'll take the time to listen, can learn a lot. Well, before you you go, and by the way, thank you for your help every year at Miller's Mission, but I got to hit you with this one. Um, It's looking pretty good. Uh, Her advantages are over now. Uh, uh, It's anybody's ball game right now. You know, we've got Congress on the Democratic side going after Elon Musk, going after Trump, but yet they support Soros, or so I should say Soros supports them. And because of that, they're getting millions of dollars through Soros. They will fight every good person who's trying to make a difference in this world, and they will go with those who are basically trying to destroy this country. So you just continue to do what you're doing because we need you, we need others who call in to voice their opinions, get their friends and families to vote and get out, make sure the vote happens so there is no chance they can mess it up. There's still talk about how they're loading things in to get so the ballots will be in their favor. But unless they're super, super sneaky about it and get things done, they cannot win. It just can't happen. The numbers are too great for Trump right now. And I don't, I don't believe the surveys that they do on the left because they always lie. Oh, we're the best there ever was. We're the best since peanut butter. So they're not. I used to have high hopes for the Democrats when John F. Kennedy. Let's see, how did he fight obesity, uh, Kevin? How did John F. Kennedy do that? In our school system, he started... You know, good physical education opportunities for people. And we had high expectations for our physical education in my day, where you ran so much, you exercised so much a day, you, you got into sports if you could. Today we have so many people who are so stuck on, the, on their phones that they don't pay attention to the people around them. And we've got to change. We've got to get back to the basics and quit doing this new math stuff. It doesn't uh, add up at all. So just just stay fired up, my friend. We, we need you. We need the others who call in to do their, their part and be a part of this great country. We, we've got so much to be thankful for. I'm grateful every day. You know me. I've held in my lifetime, I've held many different jobs just to support my family. I would hold a second and third job 
so I can feed my family. Today, it's you got to give it to me, or you, you aren't an American, or you you got to give it to these these people. But don't give it to our own people, because they might be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get out of the hole they're in. For those who are uh, unemployed, those who are homeless, and they keep driving the situation of property going up, they tax us to death. Taxes weren't designed to be everything you turn around, and I'm sorry that it, we've got to be more crucial in where we spend our money. We need to be more open of where that money goes. They need to have accountability. So all this money that's came out of any of the, the pockets that the government feels they can pull it out of, they need to have accountability for that, and they need to present the people with a spreadsheet of what they're doing. But they, they won't do that if they can get away with it. And that's on both parties. It's not just the Democrats. It is the Republicans, too. There are some of those who are just wearing those and vote no on Proposition 1. God bless. God bless you, Patriot Ray. Appreciate you. Thank you for your help with Miller's Mission. What is Miller's Mission? It's our twice-a-year event where we ask you to help out our friends at the Boise Rescue Mission. Once again, it'll be the week before Thanksgiving. We will be hanging out at the Walmart in Nampa from about 6 a.m., Actually, from 5.30 a.m. till 6 p.m. every night. Um, and then that, that's Monday through Saturday. Of course, we would love for you to join us. Bring a turkey. Give a turkey. Don't be a turkey. More details on our website, KIDOTalkRadio.com. KIDO Talk Radio. Waking up on the right side. This is the Sean Hannity Morning Minute. Ask yourself some simple questions. These are not complicated questions. You know, were you better off than you were four years ago? Was the economy better off? Were you better off with inflation? Were you better off with interest rates? Inflation just went up another 3.3% year over year this past month. You know, even Lauren Summers is saying that the Fed shouldn't have, have cut the, the interest rates 50 basis points because the economy hasn't recovered in spite of it, it us being told it's transitory. All of these things matter. Are, are the borders more safe and secure? Is that is that question a joke? From coast to coast, from sea to shining sea, it's the Sean Hannity Show. Hey, remember the old way of shopping for custom window treatments? You know, waiting around all day to get an overpriced quote from a pushy commission salesperson? Well, those days are over thanks to Blinds.com because they invented a better way. Now, with completely virtual consultations and free samples sent right to your door, you never have to deal with a salesperson in your home ever, ever again. You can always count on Blinds.com to deliver top quality window treatments now, from their premium woven wood to motorized shades, which I love, and so much more, you can get unlimited custom window treatments installed, whether it's one or a 100, for one low cost. And at Blinds.com, there are never any hidden fees. The price you see on the website is the price that you pay. Ordering online may be scary to some of you, but not with Blinds.com because they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Shop Blinds.com right now. Get up to 45% off on select styles. Save up to 45% on select styles when you go to Blinds.com. Rules and restrictions may apply. And remember, Sean Hannity today at 1, right after Clay and Buck, just days before the election, taking your calls with Kevin Miller. Hello. Good to have you with us, AJ. You're on KIDO Talk Radio. Hey, buddy. Hey, uh, anyways, I lived back in New Hampshire. Where did you, uh, where were you living at? I lived in a place called Merrimack, New Hampshire. Oh, I'm I know a, where it's at. Yeah. I'm a proud oh. graduate of Merrimack High School, and uh, my parents still live in that area. Yeah, uh, I lived in uh, just outside of Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon? In, in a place, Lebanon, yeah, mm -hmm. in a place that uh, called Eastman. Uh, it's, it's just up the road from Dartmouth College. I, and uh, anyways, it's, no, uh, it's my, weird. No, I'm telling you, my first, uh, how, where the show began was on a now defunct radio station, AM 900 WMVU in Nashua, or Nashua, as they call it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny, because we was probably back there at the same time. Uh, anyways, the Martha Raddatz interview with J.D. Vance, I watched that thing over again. And do you notice that every time J.D. Vance was making a salient point, uh, uh, Senator, uh, Senator, I want to go to something. We don't have much time, Senator, you know. Those kind of interruptions, because that guy is brilliant. 
I mean, he's quick on his feet, and he just he nailed her. Uh, so she made a comment that the mayor said that it was all a lie what Donald Trump said because he was exposed three apartment buildings being taken down by Venezuelan gangs. But yet he makes it sound like there was nothing wrong here and that Donald Trump's a bad guy for saying it. But it's, he says he was exaggerating. How many <laughs> think of any place in the world where someone would come in and take your house and they were a gang member and you weren't protected from that? Now we got three apartment buildings. It, it's amazing. I, they make it sound like it was nothing. It was huge. People at gunpoint being kicked out of their places. That's re, re, it's crazy. Well, and you go back to Martha Raddatz. She sounded like the school marm lecturing the student. And one thing that I, I love about J.D. Vance and Tom Cotton and a few others, yeah. that, that they put, push back and they go, listen to yourself. And Martha, you're not asking yeah. questions. You're lecturing me. You're no one to lecture me, Martha. Yeah. Yeah, it's, he, he does an amazing job. He keeps us cool, and he was gracious enough to not just, like, overpower and say, don't interrupt me or something. He said, okay, yeah. He lets her just hang herself. And I think it's uh, – if anyone actually watches that interview and walks away from it, see Donald Trump was lying, you know they're a libtard. There's no way they could possibly have any brains. Well, it, and, and again, it, it, you know, and it's a different style. It's a millennial style. Now – my style is more of a boomer style where, and, and having done those shows, you go, uh, excuse me, are you going to let me, you know, it, it, I'm a more adversarial guy with those shows. And, you know, it's more of uh, you keep rolling. But I got to give it to Senator Vance. He has taken it to the next level. You remember the old crossfire where you would go and you go, pardon me, I didn't interrupt you. Give me the basic decency that I gave you, sir. That doesn't play yeah. anymore, apparently. And they can't seem to handle Vance. And the guy yeah, should keep I, I doing all these things. Yeah, I think these people, there's someone with the near piece, and as soon as he starts saying anything that makes it, she goes, interrupt, <sighs> interrupt, interrupt, right. really interrupt, you know? No, <laughs> I, I, well, but that's the whole vibe, and, and you see that. Uh, look, if you watch uh, liberal ABC News is this week, if you watch, uh, you know, they let Donna Brazil run wild. They let her talk over talk everybody. And, yeah. it, you know, the the great thing was when Reince Primus, what was it, a week or two ago, just they just went at it. And it should be there. There should be more of a, a quality thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, buddy, it's, it's good to have you back. And I hope things went well. Did you get an award? Man, I guess no one listens to this program because we have. I'm sorry, I, I, I do, but I've just been busy. I've been out of town. I, I mean, well, we have the app. How dare you have a life outside of our program, AJ? <laughs> Hold on, here, 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 here. Let, let me give. We're gonna just do this. This is the loser belt. No, I didn't get it. I didn't get a gold star this year. Uh, I know. Well, I was, I was it. robbed. You I tell it. you, I was robbed. By the way, quickly, I had a guy who uh, is a very good guy inside the uh, the industry. He goes, dude. I listened to the guy that won. He's not even the best guy in his town. You were robbed. But look, here's the deal. You learn so much more by losing, and God has taught me that I need much more humility in my life than I already have. Yeah. Okay, AJ, thank you for the call. I guess nobody listens. Everybody wants to be heard, but nobody wants to listen. Anyway, AJ from New Hampshire. A lot of people from New Hampshire. Little kids got the day off. If you work for the government, you get the day off. It used to be a day that we would champion the great founder of america maybe we should bring that day back today columbus day is a federal holiday that commemorates the arrival of christopher columbus in the americas it's been a national holiday since the 1930s but in recent years there's been a push to refocus the day on native american customs and heritage this year indigenous people's day and columbus day are recognized today as they occur each year on the second monday of october while Indigenous Peoples Day is not a federal holiday, in 2023, the Biden administration issued a proclamation in recognition for the third year in a row. Due to the federal holiday of Columbus Day, post offices, banks, some schools, and federal agencies are closed. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. Yeah, interesting. And remember, Governor Little declared it Indigenous Peoples Day. I think in Washington, they declared Indigenous Peoples Day. How many people have Indigenous Peoples Day off? Remember, 
Columbus. How do they teach Columbus Day in school now? Is Columbus bad? Uh, we wouldn't have America without Columbus, would we? Yeah, New York Talk Radio. It's traffic and weather together. At least traffic. Let's get you to work safely and on time. Good morning, Dave. Dave? Good morning, Kevin. From the G&G Installation Studio, traffic now still dealing with that accident right uh, near the Broadway Interchange. It's westbound on the freeway. That could slow you down uh, about a half a mile of backup now coming uh, from uh, east of the city into downtown Boise. Direct orthopedic care for sprains, strains, and breaks. Skip the ER and go directly to Doc. Drop in without an appointment to one of five Treasure Valley locations. Visit BoiseDoc.com to learn more. That's your traffic now on KIDL. You know, where did we go wrong with Christopher Columbus? Where did we go wrong? What's wrong with honoring the guy who discovered America? Well, he did this, he did that. Okay. Can you tell me one person? One person. And with all due respect, you have the indigenous people when they had problems like the white people and the the Asian people, the other people, they, they went to war and they did bad things to each other. That's why we're human. But to get rid of Columbus Day, I can remember that we've all been worn down so much <laughs> that we we used to get fired up about that, that we used to miss Columbus Day. I'd miss Columbus Day. I think because when you attack the great explorers, the great institutions of our American republic, that when we don't honor the courage and vision it took to set out into the abyss on a tiny boat to find the new world, and we're not grateful for the blessings of freedom and prosperity resulting, then we have an issue. The idea that we're not celebrating Columbus Day. Because remember, remember, everybody thought the world was flat. And Kyrie Irving from the Dallas Mavericks, he still thinks the world is flat. I don't think the world is flat. But I have to say that I'll consider to continue to honor Christopher Columbus and all that he did. So Kevin Miller will say, happy Columbus Day, everybody. And if you're not working, you're probably not listening. And for those people who are wondering, no, we didn't win the Marconi Award. But uh, more on that in a minute. Jonathan Savage will join us exclusively from Fox News next on your home for Fox News, KIDO Talk Radio. Good morning. Going out to our friend Jonathan Savage, who joins us now. And I can feel uh, I can feel that we're worlds apart, even though we were so close to each other. Last week when we were in New York City, sir. Yeah, you've returned from the wild east, have you, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, east of the Great River. And uh, have you been to New York? Yeah, I was there last year, actually. Um, uh, yeah, I've been there quite a few times. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, I don't want to uh, alienate the good people of Boise, but New York is, is a brilliant city for me. I really enjoy it. But one of the reasons I love the United States is because you get this enormous variety of people and, and, and scenery and countryside and styles of places to visit. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I, you know, I've been to New York several times, and every time I go, I go. Pff. But I, I think I told you we were at the UN, the official mm-hmm. UN hotel. And as I, we, you and I have talked, it, those ambassadors and diplomats – And you cover those people, heads of states. It's a totally different, whacked-out vibe than even covering uh, our our nation's capital, which I've done a few times. It's uh, it's a it's a weird, different world there at the the United Nations. Yeah, and as you would expect, it's it's got a more multinational vibe than than DC would, I think, uh, in terms because you have all these people from all over the world, the different cultures all all clashing together in in a a manner you don't really get in Washington, um, having been to both cities. They are very different vibes, but um, for an outsider like me, equally fascinating. Yeah, I mean, you study the the, the culture here, and I'm just sitting there looking at a lot of French. Everybody was speaking French Mm. there, and I'm like, hey, man. (laughs) <laughs> Lafayette was good, but just remember, bro, we saved you. But uh, none, no love for, for uh, you know, a, a, you ever heard of a, a guy named Jerry Garcia? Um, was he from the Grateful Dead? Yeah. I'm not too familiar so with the got, music, but, you know, but I'm he's, familiar with the Jerry Garcia ice cream. That right, ben look, Jerry's like made. a long-haired guy with, uh, you know, protruding yeah. waistline. That, that's me. And I'm walking around there, and everybody's with their, you know, brilliant haircuts, three-piece suits, and... I've got my outfit that I'm looking for a kickball tournament on, which for 99% of people in America, they can relate to, but not at the United Nations, sir. They were not down with my look. Not down with my look at all. They were mad that I booked a room there, sir. Well, you were keeping it real, and I admire that 100%. Yes, like my boy, CM Punk. 
Mm, yeah, like CM Punk, <laughs> like Brian Danielson at yeah. the weekend, um, going out in style. Yeah, what a ripoff. What a ripoff that was. Uh, <laughs> and before, we're going to tease the wrestling. Uh, we'll get to the wrestling thing in a minute, but first let's talk about uh, NATO and uh, what's going on with them. A big exercise going on, kicking off this week. Is it true that you will be there? Um, well, it, it, it's coming to me more than anything. Oh. Um, and, you know, we talk about wrestling simulated combat. This is simulated combat, too, in the skies above the North Sea and above the United Kingdom. Uh, the steadfast noon uh, annual nuclear training is taking place uh, right now for the next two weeks. It's 2,000 personnel, 60 aircraft from 13 NATO member countries, uh, fighter jets that are capable of carrying U.S. nuclear warheads. Uh, the NATO Secretary General, Mark Rutter, said in an uncertain world, it's vital that we test our defense and we strengthen our defense so that our adversaries know NATO is ready and able to respond to any threat. So that is what they're doing right now, just about 500 miles from Russia's coastline. Boy, uh, that can't be um, welcome news to Mr. Putin. No, it's not welcome news to uh, Vladimir Putin. He says that these annual nuclear exercises are fueling tensions. Uh, his spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, says it's impossible to hold nuclear arms talks with the U.S. because Western nuclear powers are directly and indirectly involved in the conflict against Russia in Ukraine. Of course, Vladimir Putin uh, and his colleagues have been rattling their nuclear saber recently with uh, what uh, Mark Rutte called reckless and irresponsible nuclear rhetoric. So, yeah, the tension is fairly high at the moment and, and uh, very uh, suspicious eyes are being cast across um, what would, would have previously been the Iron Curtain. Uh, what, speaking of which, what is the latest concerning Russia and Ukraine? Uh, yeah, uh, the latest concerning Russia and Ukraine, um, there's a couple of different fronts. Um, firstly, I should think I should say that there were no drone attacks recorded uh, in Ukraine last night, the first night in 48, uh, in which the skies were quiet. Now, while that might be a bit of respite for Ukrainians, perhaps getting a good night's sleep for the first time in, in month, a month and a half, um, that usually is a signal that Russia is stockpiling for a larger assault. So um, Ukraine will be holding its breath as a result of that. Um, there's two other sort of fronts we, we're keeping our eye on. Firstly, in eastern Ukraine, Russia saying that it's taken another village as it continues its slow grinding offensive there in the east of the country on the ground. Um, meanwhile, Ukraine holds about 500 square miles of Russian territory. That seems to be a fair stable situation as well um, with these Ukrainian soldiers trying to distract the Russian forces and trying to get possibly perhaps a, a bit of a bargaining chip um, should we one day uh, get to the stage of negotiations to end the war. And it all continues. Finally, what did you did you watch the pay-per-view or not? No, I didn't watch the pay-per-view. Um, sadly, it clashed with uh, a local beer festival in, in my part of London. So um, I decided I'd give this one a miss. Um, and, and ended up and said enjoying um, some of the, the finest ales that East London has to offer. But I have read all about it, uh, and I think I'm quite glad I didn't watch it because it would have been very sad to see Brian Danielson end his full-time career in that manner. Yeah, it's tough for him. Uh, Brian Danielson, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, really an overachiever, but to go out that way just mm. kind of seems odd. It seems um, anticlimactic, if you will. Yeah, but I think that's also probably his decision in many ways. He, you know, he from he's the sort of of, of wrestler who, uh, you know, likes to take risks where he can. Likes to, to sort of. In, in recent months, he's shown he likes to shock the audience with what he's willing to do, uh, and also he likes to make people bigger that he loses to. He likes to put other people over in, in wrestling um, terminology, and that appears to be what he chose to do on Saturday. Indeed, indeed. Well. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, gosh, I'm not sure what else I'd like to, sh to share with you today. There's just, a, um, as usual, a heck of a lot going on in the world. Um, and as Israel now, obviously, with the uh, war in North Gaza, uh, a war in southern Lebanon, and stepping on the toes of the United Nations in southern Lebanon as well, there's a UN peacekeeping force of several thousand people, and the Israel's military uh, in, uh, apparently destroyed the main gate of a UN base. So that's something else we're keeping our eye on. Jonathan Savage, he likes his ale. <laughs> I do. 
to. Um, and uh, Yeah, an IPA, please, if you're buying. Fair enough. Uh, we will see you in Idaho one day, sir. Hope so. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Our great friend, Jonathan Savage. Remember, when you're listening to Fox News on the radio, you're listening to KIDO Talk Radio. By the way, our friends at Hoagland Meat, check them out today. You're going Hoagland Meat, hoaglandmeat.com. Why should I care about Hoagland Meat? Well, look, when you're talking about the best, we're talking fresh, local, clean beef, steaks, pork, chicken, delivered to your home. That's right. You don't have to go to the stores. We love it when you go to the stores. But if you want something that is raised in Idaho, processed in Idaho, no hormones, none of that stuff, and you want to impress people, give our friends at Hoagland Meat a look. Hoaglandmeat.com. That's H-O-A-G land. Hoagland Meat, Owahi County, out in Homedale. Great facility. I've been there. And you know me. I'm getting a little squeamish. They've got the ch- the smart chicken sampler box, the stew and roast box, the family box, the natural Idaho pork box, 10% off with the code Kevin Miller. And if you're looking for that wonderful holiday Christmas, why not say Christmas, Christmas meal, Hoagland Meat. And here's, like I said, they deliver. And I was out at the, the facility and I go, what do you mean Hoagland? And it's the Hoagland family. They go, uh, well, <clears throat> We deliver. I go, you're going to go from Homedale Star to Boise? They said, yes. Let me just say this if you like pork. Who doesn't like Idaho pork? Isn't that fun just to say pork, Idaho pork? Get a three-pound roast, two tenderloins, two pork chops, a rack of spare ribs, and three pounds of bacon, all for under $100. Kevin Miller is the code. Can I say that enough? By the way, the lady that emailed me and said, all you do is say, Kevin Miller, Kevin Miller, Kevin Miller. You're right, and I, I apologize for that. That's probably why I didn't win the prestigious Marconi Award. But really, does anybody know what it is? And Dr. Livingston, thank you for allowing me to win the prestigious Dr. Livingston Award. Award your friends, Hoagland Meat today. Hoaglandmeat.com, just check them out. And by the way, sometimes we, we get to a point in our lives where we're wondering, what can we get someone that has everything? You can't go wrong with the delivery of Hoagland meat. Here we go. We were talking about J.D. Vance. How about that? The clip that we picked actually was the same clip that Fox News is using. Here's another one. The Republicans are fighting back, and this is good news. Here is Speaker Mike Johnson on even way more liberal NBC's Meet the Press than liberal ABC News talking about why don't we have some fairness, Kristen Welker. Kamala Harris's numbers are dropping in the polls, and she just said in her own words, you saw the tape there, She, is, there is no difference between her and Joe Biden. The she, Biden policies, yeah. Bidenomics, all the things they champion are destroying the country, and everybody knows that, we, and that's why Donald Trump should be note, elected. Republicans are going to win the Senate and the House. Mr. Speaker, we should note that FEMA funds were actually redirected on Donald Trump's watch to deal with the migrant issue. Let me ask you, you mentioned the medical No, no, ma'am. No, Trump, wait a minute. No, that's yes, a, hold on, wait a minute. Wait, 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 facts are important. That is a new, that is a new program that started in 2020 under Joe Biden. That that funding wasn't necessary under Trump's administration because we secured the border. We didn't invite illegal aliens and dangerous people into the country. That's a Biden-Harris policy, and everybody Mr. knows it. Mr. Speaker, just... There we have it. We're fact-checking the fact-checkers. They don't know what to do because they can't have a show without the Republicans. And usually, they serve up the Republicans for dinner. And now you have the Republicans fighting back. We'd love to get your thoughts. 580-5436-580-KIDO. It did happen under Donald Trump's watch. But let me just ask you about medical records since you no, raised we them. No, Kristen, Should Donald no, we Trump did not. release that all of his medical brand records? New account. Should Donald Trump release all of his medical uh, he, records? He, he has. He, he issued he issued the records of his physicians. Kamala Harris issued her medical records as a diversion because she's desperate because she's thinking in the polls. You know, and, and by the way, Let's just put it to you this way. There's a lot of negativity going on. And we love having people come into the program. And we have so much to offer. But at 580-5436-580-KIDO, the polls are tied. She cannot, she cannot buy this election. Why? Because the economy is so flipping bad. So bad. So bad. 
and it should be. They should. There, there should be no Kamala Harris. There should be no any any of this. Think about that as we move along. So what are they doing? Let's let's. They're they're bringing up the medical reports. Are you kidding me? Medical reports. Uh, these are the people that covered up Joe Biden's decline, and the media has, in their zealousness to support Kamala, in their zealousness to get rid of Joe Biden. What have they done? They have simply outed themselves. Let's go back to this clip from Martha Raddatz. So there's no respect for J.D. Vance. She's lecturing him like the school marm. Now, look, I don't agree with Martha Raddatz, but I have a lot of respect for her courage. She's saying basically it's okay that the Venezuelan gangs took over just an apartment complex. We have an issue where we have people saying that in Canyon County it's going on. You have the sheriff of Canyon County saying it's not going on. We'd like to know, you know, is it going on in Canyon County, the Venezuelan gangs? There's point counterpoint. And when you have Fox News putting up a graphic saying the Venezuelan gangs are in Canyon County and the sheriff, who should know whether or not they're in Canyon County, saying they're not, and then people are saying, well, nope, the sheriff's lying. Well, who do you believe? Do, is it time to get in the the the, the vehicle and, and drive around and say, hey, are you a Venezuelan gang person? It makes as much sense as that last statement as Martha Raddatz saying this. It, the incidents were limited to a handful of apartment complex, uh, apartment complexes, and the mayor said our dedicated police officers have acted on those concerns. A handful of problems. Only, Martha, do you hear yourself? Only a handful of apartment complexes in America were taken over by Venezuelan gangs, and Donald Trump is the problem and not Kamala Harris's open border? Americans are so fed up with what's going on, and they have every right to be. And I, I really find this exchange, Martha, sort of interesting because you seem to be more focused with nitpicking everything that Donald Trump has said rather than acknowledging that apartment complexes in the United States of America America are being taken over by violent gangs. I worry so much more about that problem than anything else here. We've got to get American communities in a safe space again. And unfortunately, when you let people in by the millions, most of whom are unvetted, most of whom you don't know who they really are, you're going to have problems like this. Kamala Harris, 94 executive orders that undid Donald Trump's successful border policies. We knew this stuff would happen. That's, they that's... bragged about opening the border, and now we have the consequences, and we're living with it. We can do so much better, but frankly, we're not going to do better, Martha, unless Donald Trump calls this stuff out. I'm Yeah, take that, Martha. Let's get your reaction next. Kevin Millar, KIDO Talk Radio. Here that... Uh... That uh, filled up the room with balloons. And uh, they decided uh, my cholesterol level needed a break, so they didn't give me a bucket full of chicken, which probably would have gone bad here if we had been here for quite some time. But we are back. Do want to thank everybody for who supported our run to New York. Top five in the country. No, we didn't win the big one. And then uh, it's, it's strange. You ever go somewhere where all your friends or your foes seem to win, but you don't? And I'm sitting here uh, looking at uh, my one of the KDK in Pittsburgh one, the station that fired me, but I, I knew the, the guy that runs the place. I was the one that told him another station in Nashville, they won. And a buddy of mine in Dallas, who I never met in person, won. And I'm like, man, I would have loved to have talked to that guy. It's, it's really not about trophies as we f- figure out what, as kids, it's about relationships. But we're back. Uh, we are locked into Miller's mission coming up the week before Thanksgiving, where we ask you to give a turkey, don't be a turkey, to help out our friends at the Boise Rescue Mission. More of your phone calls coming up. And it is Happy Columbus Day. Do you remember Christopher Columbus? Let's get you to work safely and on time. You're listening to KIDO Talk Radio. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, Kevin. From the G&G Installation Studio, as you're coming out of Camden County into Ada County, traffic looking good on 84 and the freeway coming eastbound. Now westbound, right to near the Broadway interchange where you had an accident earlier. Still working. That one could be delayed just a bit there. Direct orthopedic care for sprains, strains, and breaks. Skip the ER and go directly to Doc. Drop in without an appointment to one of five Treasure Valley locations. Visit BoiseDoc.com to learn more. That's your traffic now on KIDO. 
Appreciate that. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to our friend Jason, who is in Florida. Jason, are you okay? Well, Kevin, I, I think I'm feeling like you did last week. I came down with a pretty severe head cold and <clears throat> trying to power through it. But, um, yeah, we're, we're doing all right. It's, we're getting tired. Um, there were three point. Four million people in the state of Florida that alone that did not have power, and I think right now it's down to four hundred something thousand. So we're chipping away, um, but yeah, it, 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 you would be amazed at the responses we get down here. Um, people are either irately mad that we didn't fix it the day it happened, or something. I've had to use the line of "ma'am." There's 3.4 million people out of power. You're not alone. Probably 20 times. Um, the other people, uh, mainly the boomer generation, they are fully supportive. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's just, it'll blow your mind some of these people down here. It's, they're nothing like Georgia. Georgia is nothing like this. It was a lot kinder. But, uh, yeah. We're, we're chipping away. Uh, the damage here, I mean, the tornadoes just wrecked this state. Um, that's, that was the big thing here was the tornadoes. This is where I am on the east coast of Florida. Um, by far, that was the biggest uh, wrecking ball here. Well, um, the psychological damage, not only to you, but to the people there, can you talk about the neighborhoods and everything? Yeah, you would be, I mean, you may or may not be, but uh, the lack of preparation some of these people had is quite astonishing. You know, it's uh, everybody and their dog knew about this hurricane for a week prior. And, uh, you know, I know Floridians have their pride about surviving hurricanes and everything like that, but some of these people didn't do a lick of anything to prepare and then expect the government to, or whoever to help them, uh, help yourself, you know. It's, um, that was kind of shocking to me down here. It's just a lack of preparation a lot of people um, had. And you saw the effects of it with the, the massive power outages. Um, a lot of the businesses took preparations. I, I took some pictures of how they barricaded their windows. I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. That's a good design. I can see how that would work. But uh, people in their homes, oh, man, it seemed like nothing and nobody did anything. So then trim trees, then uh, barricade, flood, nothing. What about the gators? So, you seen the animals or anything? Yeah, actually, I just saw a shark about 12 foot long, and then um, no, but, hey, I'm on the phone real quick. Be right there. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, just pulled up to another job. But, um, yeah, I just saw about a 12-foot shark. We did run into a gator, too. Uh, one was only about six foot, the other one about eight. And um, I had to try and rope my crew back in from trying to ride it. So uh, between hurting the cats and my crew and um, everything, the snakes, on the other hand, they're an issue. Um, a lot of these don't make a sound, and I'll get after you. So we're... We killed two snakes so far, and it, it, it's uh, always on our mind. So, uh, Kevin, I gotta let you go. Okay. We are thank you, Jason. Up to another job, and we'll get back with you as soon as we can. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. There we have it, our friend Jason, who's working for the power companies, watching out for the snakes and the gators and the sharks fighting a cold, and you think you have a tough day. What do you say to that, Pete, from Mountain Home on KIDO Talk Radio? Well, I say welcome back uh, from the, shall we say, the uh, the anarchy, anarchist city of New York City, where I understand the Trende Arugua gang is got 12-year-olds uh, robbing people on Times Square. Thank you, Kamala. Anyway, uh, I'd like to discuss Columbus Day just sort of briefly here. We, oh, and you're familiar with the term cultural misappropriation. Oh, very much so. 
Yeah, like if you wear a sombrero and a serape to a Halloween party you're, and you're not Mexican, you can't do that. That's cultural misappropriation. Well, the term Native American. I was born in Ohio, so I am a Native American, right? Yeah, I, I've always said that we're all Native Americans, but I don't know if the politically correct Politburo would go along with that. But I agree with you, yes. Well, the term American is a European term. And the continents were named after an Italian map maker named Amerigo Vespucci. Yes, my boy. I and remember that from the Western Cult. The term Native American by anyone except Europeans is therefore a cultural misappropriation. The use of the term Indian should refer only to the con inhabitants of the Indian subcontinent. Although the term Indian is also an English term applied by England to their conquest in that subcontinent. So the, let's see, the indigenous tribal early inhabitants of this continent are not permitted to use the term Native American or the term Indian because those are cultural misappropriations of English and American language. So they can't call themselves that. Hmm. <laughs> Why do we diss Columbus? Um, I have no idea. I really don't. Uh, you know, it's not like he personally took over the two continents and enslaved everyone. Now, admittedly, the Spaniards did that in Latin America and South America. Can I use those terms? Sure. Okay, uh, but when you look at what was going on in this continent and Mexico and everywhere else before the Europeans got here, what we had was tribal warfare constantly. And I very much doubt that there's any individual tribe right now that is occupying the territory that they were the original occupants of because they were pushing each other out and raiding each other all the time. I mean, you look down in the southwest at the Anasazi, who were the ancient ones that were pushed out by the Navajo and the Hopi. So I don't know why, yeah, I don't know why we got to pick on Columbus. I mean, let's, let's face it, if the Europeans had not arrived here, this place would still be constant warfare. And uh, they did a lot of human sacrifice, too. Oh, yeah, the Aztecs, the great civilization of the Aztecs, where you got to rip the heart out of a living person. Yes. Because God's wanted that. I, I agree. Uh, <sighs> crazy times, brother, crazy times. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear any complaints about my calling myself a Native American because I was born in America and I am a native. And anyone else who uses that that is not a Native American is guilty of cultural misappropriation. Pete, so I, I appreciate that. Happy Columbus Day, everybody. Happy Columbus Day. Catch you later. All right. See you later. Coming up, more of your calls. The new police chief of Boise will be joining us as well. Can't wait to hear what he has to say. He'll be in studio and we'll get his reaction to the balloons. Kevin Miller on your home for Fox News, brought to you by Beacon Plumbing, KIDO Talks. Wished us well and all sorts of things. I guess we could call this program the J.D. Vance Show. We are celebrating Columbus Day. Many people have it off because we've replaced Columbus with Indigenous People Day. However, we are working and we are honoring J.D. Vance, the next vice president of the United States of America. We have to remember, Shannon, that we followed the advice of those congressmen for 30 years in this country. China now has 32% of world manufacturing GDP. America has 18% of world manufacturing GDP. Unless we use the power that we have economically to bring back good manufacturing, we're going to wake up in a country 20, 30 years from now where everything that we need, the pharmaceuticals that we put into the bodies of our children, the weapons of war that our troops use are made by foreign countries that don't like us very much. The only way to, to, to prevent that and the only way to rebuild the prosperity we had 30 years ago is to do what Donald Trump is proposing. Well, one final point on this tariff issue, Shannon, is for 200 years, the American economic miracle was built by using tariffs when appropriate to ensure that American workers could thrive. We've gone the other direction for 30 years. 
That is, uh, and again, a lot of people may not know the reference. That is Pat Buchanan 101. Pat Buchanan, a presidential candidate back in the day, in the early 90s, the only person besides Donald Trump, and this includes uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan, who cared about the American workers. And we saw this under Bill Clinton. We saw this under Barack Obama. We even saw this under George Bush. Thanks, Obama. Where we would have our jobs being offshore to China. And it was our boy Tucker Carlson during the pandemic that revealed that all the medicines that keep us alive are made from China, are in China. So why in the world would we not want to be self-sufficient? Why in the world would we not want to make sure that we can take care of ourselves? So that is the latest from J.D. Vance. Another quick topic, you're going to love this because the media is in an uproar. Uh, The elites are in an uproar. The Idaho statesman's in an uproar because despite them trying to sell us a piece of blank, a piece of whatever you want to call it, of new ideas that are going nowhere. In other words, Bidenomics has to be the worst set of economic principles that we've ever seen in in our entire lifetime. Bidenomics, Americans are not buying it. In fact, and this is what we talk about with our friend Tom Grisham. You know, he hosts Gun Talk, noon to three on KIDO Talk Radio on Sundays. Nobody likes a poser. Nobody likes a poser when it comes to veterans. Nobody likes a poser when it comes to guns. Nobody likes a poser when it comes to hunting. So we had Minnesota Waltz, otherwise known as Governor Walls, deciding to go out and prove that he's a hunter. Now, remember, the Democrats want to take away your guns. The Democrats want to do all sorts of craziness. And here is the reaction from David Urban, a political consultant, one of ours, on CNN. to be close. She had a terrible week. It was a terrible week for the Harris this, this campaign. You had Gretchen Whitmer having to apologize to the Catholics across America for mocking them with some Dorito, bizarro Dorito thing on, on there. You had um, Governor Elmer Fudd out hunting and um, not knowing how to load his shotgun, using the wrong gun. At the same time... Was Governor Tra- Elmer Fudd? Governor Walsh was out oh. there. looked like Elmer Fudd. You know, <laughs> be very, very quiet while hunting for wabbits. Oh, my God. Right? So, so he, he, does, he can't load his shotgun. He's trying to appeal to hunters. He can't load the gun. He's using the wrong gun. At the same time, you have Barack Obama in Pennsylvania deriding, who, where he derided people who own guns. Remember? Cling, people in Pennsylvania were bitter and they cling to guns and religion. Remember that in 2008? So they're trying to appeal to those folks at the same time while he alienates black male voters by chastising them. So they had a really tough week this well, week. Well, hold on. Okay. So first of all. Yeah, he had a tough week. You know, it's bad when they're going to medical records. And as someone who is a proud practicing Catholic, um, Gretchen Whitmer should be ashamed of herself. She went on a podcast and apparently on the podcast, what you do is you pretend it's a very sacred ritual. Obviously, Protestant churches believe in communion as well. And they, uh, they, you know, had her give a Dorito as people get, you know, the Eucharist. And she had to apologize for it. The insanity that is continuing, it is just irresponsible. Unfortunately, it is irresponsible and Americans are getting tired of it. Uh, how's that? We'll tell you about that in a minute. Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. And uh, that that apparently is where we're at here, the final countdown right before the election. And I know that most of you, and God bless you, you go to church and you pray, or some of you go hunting or hiking or all these wildlife outdoor things that people do with their Subarus or their big F-150s. And I get it. Now, for me, Sunday and after... Oh, I don't know. Is it, I guess it's 12 years of marriage, if I can make it till November. I'm always one of these people, you never want to assume anything. But after 12 years, almost 12 years of marriage, that'll be next month, Kevin Miller. Thank you. Um, I've actually gotten Mrs. Miller to believe that I'm working on Sunday by watching the shows. And so whether it's Meet the Press, whether it's this week, as we've been discussing, the, the Sunday shows are an indicator of how the week was for the Democrats and how the week will be. You've heard the clip of J.D. Vance talking about the, um, the Venezuelan gangs. Oh, it's only a couple buildings. Are you listening to yourself, Martha? Well, NBC sounded the big alarm, the huge alarm, because they've got a new poll out saying 
it's anybody's ball game. Now, remember, and there are a lot of people now, Chris Christie and others, going after Donald Trump, saying at 78, he's not the same that he was at 68. No, neither am I. Neither are you. Neither is anybody. But the emotional strain that is on him from the money people, from the legal people, from the political people, because you've got the Bush and the Cheneys and the Romneys, they're out to get him as well. And no matter how thick your skin is, we all want to be liked. We all want to be loved. And to have that intensity, then you have the Kamala ads. And it's still not enough. Thank God it's not enough, considering where the economy is right now. Let's take a listen to Steve Kondracki on NBC's Meet the press. I mean, the top line is the five point advantage that Kamala Harris had in our last poll is gone. What's behind that shift? Yeah, exactly, Savannah. I mean, just look at them side by side and you can see it. Remember that poll we took a month ago that you see here? It was just after that first Trump Harris debate. Since then, we've had the VP debate. There have been some campaign activities, some interviews, some things that have changed in that time. I think this might be the biggest for Harris. We just asked the basic image perception people have is it positive or negative of these candidates? The Trump number's always been somewhere in this territory. In fact, this is a little bit high for him, believe it or not, 43% positive. But look at Harris, 43 positive, 49 negative. The significance, we polled this a month ago. She was 48% positive and 45 negative. She was above water, as they say. That's completely reversed. It now looks very similar to Trump's. That's a pretty big shift when you're talking about a race this close. And then there's the weight of the fact she's the VP in an unpopular administration. We asked about President Biden's policies. Are they helping or hurting your family? Just a quarter of voters said they're helping. Nearly half said they're hurting. And then here's the interesting twist. We also asked folks, think back to when Donald Trump was president. Did his policies help or hurt your family? So anyway, by the way, that's my mistake. That's from the Today Show, which is updating what happened on Meet the Press. So it's anybody's ball game. And imagine being outspent, not outworked, but uh, as we talked about yesterday, or I'm sorry, on Friday, you have Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, a lot of surrogates aiding Kamala Harris, and it's not going to work. Even Chris Matthews, uh, they brought him out of the doldrums, uh, our old friend, saying that it's a big mistake for Harris to say her policies are going to be like Joe Biden's. Well, that's all she knows. That's ser- seriously all she knows at 580-5436, 580-KIDO. Um, by the way... Uh, Joe Biden is still the president of the United States. You're going to love this one. And I know from experience how devastating it is to lose your home. Several years ago, my home was struck by lightning. It didn't all burn down, but we're out of the home for seven months while it was being repaired. The thing I was most concerned about was not just the home, was all those things, all those all those pictures I saved my that my daughter had drawn when she was little, all the... All the, all the family photographs. All- so here you are in Florida. Whoa, 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 whoa. And if you missed it earlier, Jason called in. And maybe one day when Jason comes home, we can have Jason come into studio. Jason's from Idaho. Jason is a power line worker. I, he probably got his job after he worked in CUNA at the Power Line University or the Power Climbers University, the, the Pole Climber University in CUNA. World famous. You go there for a year or whatever, you get out and you make 70, 80, 90 grand a year. Already, people need the people to climb the power poles. So our guy, Jason, <clears throat> who listens to this program, and maybe he's listening to it right now. Remember, he said, Kevin, I got to go there. I got another job. He's away from his home, drove there with his crew, was in Georgia, was in the Carolinas, now in Florida. And I go, hey, bro. What's going on there? He goes, dude, there's gators. I saw a nine-foot shark. I saw snakes. So, and this is a guy who's visiting. So he's like in a man camp and he's safe. Imagine all of a sudden you got, you're walking down the street and there's a gator or a snake. And then you have the president of the United States saying, oh yeah, I remember this. I had a small kitchen fire and I, I lost the pictures of, uh, you know, the, the, the little drawings that Hunter used to make when he was a little boy. It, is that empathetic? Caddy Talk Radio. Let's get you to work safely and on time. Good morning, Dave.
Good morning, Kevin. From the G&G Installation Studios, traffic on the freeway. You do have an accident westbound to right at the 42 on-ramp, so watch for that. Another injury crash working at Eustick and Maple Grove. Police and paramedics responding to that three-car accident. If you have an accident, Mike Miniger's Auto Body will restore your vehicle to pre-accident condition, and they guarantee their work. Call Mike Miniger's Auto Body. Visit BoiseAutoBody.com. That's your traffic now. I'm Dave Burnett on KIDO Talk Radio. And you want to thank our friends at Window World Boise, windowworldboise.com. Um, I'm getting my new windows this week. We'll have complete coverage on, well, on my social media. I do want to thank Window World Boise. Still not too late to get your windows done before the winter. Think about that. Uh, make sure that the cold doesn't come in. It's an investment, but it's worthwhile. And I trust my home to our friends at Window World Boise. Uh, quickly, here is one of the most outrageous stories perpetrated by liberal NBC News. Apparently, hurricane responders have been evacuated from North Carolina after the National Guard reportedly found armed militia hunting FEMA. Come on, man. This morning, growing safety fears for government workers in western North Carolina, supporting ongoing recovery efforts from Hurricane Helene. According to the Washington Post, an urgent message was sent to numerous federal agencies on Saturday, warning FEMA has advised all federal responders in Rutherford County, North Carolina, to stand down and evacuate the county immediately, adding that National Guard troops had come across trucks of armed militia, saying they were out hunting FEMA. NBC News has not seen the email cited by the Post, and it's unclear whether the threat mentioned was seen as credible. North Carolina Republican Congressman Chuck Edwards addressing the reported threats on MSNBC. We had two counties with uh, folks reported uh, with uh, different militia groups attacking and a threat and threatening FEMA. In a statement to NBC News, FEMA writing in part... Okay, first of all, if this story is true, and I don't doubt the congressman, uh, having been familiar with North Carolina and North Carolina people, I find that very hard to believe. Although there are some people that don't like the government, why would you be hunting FEMA? And oh, by the way, do you need to bring in the National Guard? As somebody pointed out, I think it was J.D. Vance, you've got the 82nd Airborne in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Why were they not activated when this thing went down? Part of their their mission is to go into foreign countries and to help the populace. And plus you have the special forces there. Uh, what is it, the Joint uh, Operations Special Warfare Command, whatever it's called. With all due respect, sorry I didn't get it right. However, you have those people there. You would be flooding the zone. And the fact that this government didn't do it, and if you're going to hunt the federal government, you're going to f- hunt FEMA, uh, that should not be tolerated. Where is the, you know, what, what are they called in, in, the, in the Gulf, Schwarzkopf, with overwhelming force? So uh, to the militia people, if this is true, uh, you're not helping the cause. And if it's not true... Shame on our friends in the media for perpetrating this lie. Anyway, coming up, Chief Dennison joins us. We're going to talk about the Boise Police Department, policing in general. Obviously, we're a big fan of law enforcement. I'm sure we'll get Lee Joe to come in to give us his thoughts about law enforcement throughout the city of Boise. We welcome him to the city. He's a, a very nice young man, and uh, hopefully, uh, for my sake, we're going to have a good conversation. Kevin Miller on your home for Fox News, brought to you by Beacon Plumbing, KIDO Talk Radio. Chris Dennison, Chief Dennison, thank you for joining us. Good to have you in studio. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, uh, it's a, a, it's amazing when we think about police, obviously policing in the news. Um, your thoughts on coming into Boise and, and really what it means to you? Well, I've been in law enforcement for over 20 years um, and coming to Boise and th- this is just a phenomenal opportunity. Everything I had read about the department um, and having been here now for a little over a month, uh, the department has definitely lived up to the expectations I had. I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to be here. I think this, this city, this community should be very proud of their police department. They got amazing men and women that go out every day to do their best to keep the community safe. And what's that like for you coming into a new community? Uh, it is, uh, as many people have told me, and I believe it's like drinking from a fire hose. There are so many, so many things coming at you. Um, just you know, wrapping my hands around the agency itself, the policies. Um, Idaho law and just the meet and greets with, uh, different stakeholders, the department, the department members itself. I've spent the last month hitting every squad, um, trying to meet as many people as possible, get a real sense of the department and then just learning the culture of it. It is, it's been a whirlwind. It, you know, the days are long. Um, even in my off time, you know, I'm 
reading I, I'm reading policy. I'm I'm looking at different things from the department, just trying to get caught up as quickly as I can. So, uh, but it is it has really been an amazing experience. Well, what brought you to Boise? Obviously, um, we were talking about uh, you know an opening, some other candidates. Really, nobody from within the state that we know of. And and again, you know, here you got this guy from Arizona coming in. That's a challenge. That's a challenge for you. But uh, your thoughts on the process of determining why you wanted to come to Boise and then getting the job? Yeah. So uh, this was, you know, I was born and raised in Tucson. My wife was the same, and we had her and I had talked about wanting to explore a different part of the country. Uh, just. You know, it's such a great place to live. And we've, you know, her and I and my daughter, we've done road trips cross country. And, and we thought, you know, it would be, it'd be super exciting to try to live in a different place. Um, but I wasn't actively looking for another job. I was very happy in Tucson. I had, you know, a great assignment. I worked with people I've worked with for 20 years. I mean, it was my home away from home. Um, so I would see these emails that would come up from, uh, different, uh, groups like the police executive research forum, you know, chiefs opening in this city or chiefs opening this town. And I, I deleted them. I, I never paid much attention to them. And then for whatever reason, one popped up and it was for the city of Boise. And, you know, I remember sitting back in my chair and thinking about it for a second and I, you know, I sent it over to my – forwarded the email to my wife and, you know, like, hey, what do you think about this? And I started jumping in and doing some research on the city and the police department. And and I – you know, I was thinking to myself, like, this is this is an amazing opportunity for – to go work in, with an amazing community with a, with a fantastic police department and explore a different part of the country um, from where I am. But, which Chief, is, to, to leave your home, nobody really leaves their home, do they? I, Right. No, this is, you know, to say it's not scary is would be an understatement. This, you know, we we don't know anybody up here. You know, in fact, the only time I hadn't even been to Idaho when this when this uh, position came open. Um, and, you know, my wife emailed me back and was like, you know, th- throw your hat in the ring. You know, she, everything we had read and heard about Idaho and the city of Boise and Treasure Valley was fantastic. And we thought, what a great place to bring our daughter and expose her to this community and, you know, let her, you know, raise her in a great, in a great place. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I th- threw my hat in the ring. It was, did you start researching Boise, Idaho then, obviously? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I think that afternoon I was, you know, I was online reading as much as I could. Um, and I, there wasn't anything that I read that really turned me off from wanting to move and m- move up here and explore this. Um, you know, it's obviously not without its. I'm not. I'm not without my fears and concerns. Right. This is this is huge. My whole family is in Tucson, and my friends. The you know the world I've known for over forty years is there. So, uh, this is this is definitely an adventure, and I'm excited to be on it. And I'm very excited to get my wife and daughter up here. And that's uh, amazing, Chief Tennyson, with us on KIDO Talk Radio from Boise PD, that you would admit that you have concerns. I mean, usually we're taught as men, well, no vegetables. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, look, I, you know, my my philosophy is I, I am who I am, and um, I need to expose that. Look, there's every one of us has concerns, every one of us has fears, and a lot of times we like to bury them and not talk about them. Um, but if I'm going to lead a police department and really focus in the areas that are concerning to me, meant, you know, employee wellness, um, you know, you have to be willing to talk about the things that are concerning to you and address them. Otherwise, you know, you bury them. You're not going to – it's not going to do anybody any good. So um, I've really taken that approach of, well, this is this is where I'm at. This is where my head's at. And um, I want to be true to myself, so you know, and not be fake to anybody. This, I'm, you know, I am who I am and I'm going to do the absolute best job I can. Um, by being me. 580-5436-580-KIDO if you have a question for the chief. how w- What was the interview process like? Because you had some other people that, you know, obviously there were a lot of candidates and there were people that may have had less experience, more experience, and you're kind of the plucky underdog from Tucson. I mean, what was that like uh, to to interview people from another part of the country that you never knew about, though? I mean... Yeah, I, you know, I don't think anybody's ever called me plucky before. I like that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you, um, so I, you know, I didn't meet 
uh, the first time I met any of the candidates was when I came up for the finalist interviews, um, and I was super impressed with them. Um, and I, I remember, uh, I remember going, okay, I'm competing against these guys, but I really like them, and I thought either either one of them would have done a great job um, as chief, you know. But the interview process, you know, the process itself was pretty arduous. And, you know, it was several interviews and then two days of interviews once I got up here. Yeah, what was that like, like meeting the, the I guess it would be the city council people and the mayor? What was that like? That was good. I mean, it, those those two days were such a whirlwind because it was just, it was interview after interview after interview with different groups. It was community groups, internal groups, you know, stakeholders within the city, um, some folks from the council, the mayor, the chief of staff, uh, you know, everybody was great. Um, but again, it's an interview process. And so they're peeling back every layer of your life. They're asking you questions. Um, and my, you know, my philosophy with it was I'm, I'm just going to be me because I'm not going to come up here and be, you know, I'm not going to put on a, a facade and then have to come up here and live that facade for however long, um, the city keeps me here. And the department wants me here. You know, I I'm going to be me, and if it if I'm the right fit, then fantastic. If I'm not, that's okay too. Um, but it was exhausting. I I can tell you each night at the when I get back to the hotel, I slept very well. I, I was out like a light just from being exhausted of, you know, being having everything pried into. And for me personally, I I'm an introvert by nature. Like I literally have to. You know, I have to emotionally gear up to go out and, um, you know, with large scale community events and stuff like that. And I love talking to people, but just my nature itself is I'm an introvert. I like, I like being at home. I like, you know, best nights for me is being at home with my wife and daughter. My wife and I watching a show together and Mm -hmm. my daughter playing and goofing off. And, you know, that is, those are the perfect nights for me. Right. So, but again, it it must have been culturally a little different because you're, Coming to Idaho, and again, you're in Tucson, so it's a little off the beaten track, but uh, I was watching College Game Day over the weekend. They they couldn't believe how far out Eugene is. So you come to the most isolated urban region in the country. You're interviewing the mayor, or the mayor is interviewing you, city council people, maybe department heads. And then, of course, you still have your daytime job in Tucson So and your family. And living all this must have been, uh, if nothing else, sir, a growing experience, I would imagine. Oh, I... I- <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I I wish I could. It, it was definitely a surreal experience. It's still been a surreal experience. I mean, since this entire process started for me in, oh, I, I submitted my resume and cover letter in June. Um, and then it was, you know, within a few weeks, everything kicked off. And since basically, yeah, since mid-June to now, it's it's been a whirlwind of just, going completely outside of my comfort zone um really moving away from everything that i know that is safe to uh to a whole new world but you know I, one of the things that's been so great is everybody has been very welcoming everybody has been so helpful from the community members the stakeholders to the to the department the the officers the detectives the professional staff the command team um the you know, everybody has been welcoming. They've been helpful. They've, you know, when I have, que- you know, when I have questions, nobody looks at me like I'm from another planet. They're just, they're, they're fantastic. And I, I, I'm very appreciative of the relationships I've already started to build here. It's been very helpful. Let's go to the phones. Liberal Steve joins us now. He lives in Tucson and he was talking about you uh, for quite some time. So, uh, Liberal Steve, uh, welcome. Uh, your chief is here. What would you like to say? I'm just sorry that I left the place in such chaos for him. You know, I uh, came down here, Tucson, you know, is so squared away and everything's just perfect. Right, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> well, like like any large city and, you know, Tucson is the 33rd largest in the country. It, it has its challenges, but, um, you know, I called a home for over 43 years you know it is it's a great place to live with great people and you have a great police department there that they're working as hard as they can to keep that community safe well i want you to get on kevin miller at least once a month and take calls and take questions yeah well, i'm sure the chief will uh to listen to what you have to say sir 
Well, not as much as we do. He <laughs> will. He will, just like you will. And and Kevin Miller is is as dumb as he looks. I want you to know. Thank that. you. Yes, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't disagree with you on that. Yes. Anyway, you stay fired up. Do you miss all the the two or three shootings a week down here? I would have to say that uh, I do not miss that. Um, it was interesting when I was up here for my finalist interviews, and I was discussing with the other candidates the fact that the city had, the city of Boise had only had three homicides the year before. And I'm looking at my email from Tucson. I'm getting emails and updates from my captain. I was over investigations. Um, when I had left and we'd had two homicides the night before. Um, and I was getting updates on those cases. So, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely takes its toll when you're constantly dealing with that level of violence. So, you know, again, to everybody I worked with in Tucson, the, the officers, the detectives, the command team, the supervisors, the professional staff, uh, they do an amazing job in a violent city, um, to try to keep everybody as safe as they possibly can. And oh it, yeah, and to keep I, you I safe. I love the police here. Yeah, well, I love the police. Well, here. because you're you're Will all you about stay? legal weed. Yes, I know. Why don't you go toke up? Now? Well, you're darn right. Yeah, you know we're adults down here, right, officer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Liberal Steve. Stay fired up, buddy. Yep. Go toke one for us, Chandler in Boise on KIDO Talk Radio. Radio for Chief Dennison. Go ahead, Chandler. Good morning. Hey, Kevin. Good morning, and Chief. Welcome to Boise. I really. Really, really hope you're successful. Um, my question has to do with evidence, and it's related to a very controversial case that happened here. If you haven't heard of it, well, you probably will. Um, there was a – Diane Laciondo was a, his a former Ada County commissioner who was Democrat. She was currently serving on the Central District Health Board. This is during the time of COVID, and they were proposing to do a mask mandate. Naturally, there are some people that are very spirited about this, and there are protests that were done. One of the protests included three individuals, Robert Jones, Susan Lang, and reporter for the Idaho Dispatch, David Pettinger. They chose to be on the public sidewalk in front of a residence because normally she would remote in to do the meetings, and so that would make it a public space. Unfortunately, they got that wrong. She wasn't there, but her kids were. They were scared. They got charged, went to jail. One person pled it out. One person was there for a week or two. Robert Jones got six months for mostly peaceful protesting. The issue and the concern that I have about this case was that during the trial, the judge allowed Diane Laciano's kids to go on the stage and be, uh, and to, they were on the stage present and, uh, sorry, on the stand and they talked about, you know, distress and trauma and these kinds of things. Okay, that's fine. However, there was no licensed certified mental health professional to come up and give a diagnosis. There was no clinical therapist that they had been working with to resolve their issues. There was no indication of medication that was being used or consumed by these kids to, uh, you know, allege that they'd been harmed. So the, by this standard of evidence, it really reminds me of a time in American history where four girls were scared, and based upon their fears of certain adults in the community, 200 people were convicted and 19 were hung. That place is Salem Town, and I'm talking about the Salem Witch Trials. Myself and many members of our community are gravely concerned that if a judge can allow scared kids on the stand to allege harm and someone can go to jail for six months, we've got quite a broken jail, uh, quite a broken judicial system. So I would just like you to be aware of this and maybe address it and let us know how, you know, people who are engaging in civil protest or actions don't have to worry about going to jail for six months. Well, Chandler, thank you for the call. And, you know, Chief, you take a look at... Um I don't know how you guys handled the pandemic, but it was pretty, pretty rough here where you had people protesting and then you had some people doxing police officers' homes. It, it was a challenge. And again, that was a very unique time in life. And you have this rise and thank you for the call, Chandler, where people, you know, continue to question authority. How do you live in that world, sir? So, you know, we didn't have, I mean, we had some protest activity related to the mask mandates. Those were pretty minimal. Um, most of, most of the bandwidth for us during that time were, uh, surrounded the George Floyd protests that, and riots that followed from there. So that was pretty significant for us. Um, look, at the end of the day, the, it, it's simple. There are, the Constitution's pretty clear, especially in the First Amendment about the right to, uh, to assemble and, um, to uh, to address grievances with the government, um, and as long as those are done in lawful in a lawful manner in a lawful space, um, the police department 
under my watch will ensure that those rights are protected. It, you know, it's that simple. Um, it doesn't matter what you're protesting. I did the same thing in Tucson. We had lawful protests and we had people that were not violating the law and they were saying, you know, they were saying horrible things to a lot of the officers um, under my command in Tucson during that time. But what they were doing at the, what, when they were engaged in lawful activities, that was protected speech. And we were there to ensure that uh, those rights were protected. And that'll be the same here. So. Uh, Chandler, thank you for the call. 580-5436-580-KIDO. Talking about uh, policing. So first of all, again, we can't say this enough. Welcome to Idaho. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I don't know after la- those last couple calls, but again, uh, the, the First Amendment lives here. So what's the status of, of the Boise Police Department as you've uh, evaluated it? You've uh, been grilled about it. You've met the folks. Obviously, you've been in town for a short time. But what, what's the what's the status of the police department? Well, I think uh, I think Ron Weiniger did a uh, great job in leaving the department in a, in a good spot. Uh, so we are the department itself is anticipated to be fully staffed to its current authorized strength um, in January of next year, which is phenomenal uh, for for a city. You know, so many agencies around the country are struggling to hit staffing levels. Um, uh, you know, our uh, targeted staffing levels. So the fact that Boise PD is going to be there and we can look at growing the department um, coming at, coming into 2025 and 2026, I think is phenomenal. Um, the department has done a tremendous amount of work in reevaluating its policies, making sure that they're meeting, uh, you know, industry standards. What's What are best practices? Uh, you have a department that is, that so much of it is engaged in community community level policing. You have your neighborhood contact officers. You have your SROs. Um, you know, you, you have, which is nice. You don't have co- you have cops that are going call to call from the patrol from the patrol side of the house. But you also have cops that are actively engaged in community problems, um, working as hard as they can to resolve some of those issues and really keep the city as safe as it is. So I, I think the department's in a fantastic spot. I think it's in a great a great place for growth. One of the things that I've been uh, having conversations about within the department and outside the department is looking at technology upgrades and how we can uh, more seamlessly integrate technology across different different areas. Whether you know from the report writing side to what so officers aren't having to do things redundantly, where they're not having to write a report here and then create that some similar documents in another system. Um, we're also looking at infrastructure for the department. You know, the city of Boise and Treasure Valley itself are slated to grow pretty significantly over the next 20 years. So we really need to be thoughtful in building the infrastructure for the department now that can sustain that growth. You know, and that comes to an east side substation where we have officers based out of the east side of the city as opposed to the uh, to the west side. So response times are reduced in that area and having a public facing footprint over there where people can come on the east side of the city and engage with the PD there um, at their own facility. Uh, you know, expanding our ability for training. Um, you know, one of the one of the concerns we run into is um, the emergency vehicle operations for training, just having access to a track to practice um, pursuit driving, um, pursuit intervention training, the things along those lines, uh, you know, you have, there's a lot of folks in Treasure Valley, a lot of departments in Treasure Valley that are, um, vying for a small slot there, uh, to get that training in. So it's, you know, how can we ex- expand building another track, um, to really not just help the city of Boise, but, uh, the other agencies that we're going to partner with, uh, cause we are going to partner with every, every other police department in Treasure Valley. We want to be, you know, it's one team really trying to work to make sure not just the city of Boise, but the the community of Treasure Valley is safe and working seamlessly together. So the, those are things that I think uh, we want to work toward. But the PD itself, the men and the women that are there, this place, this city, this community has a lot to be proud of with their police department. Yeah. And how is you, how do you as a, you know, a, a law enforcement professional for over 20 years, you know, most of us, we watch the law and order and we all, we're all experts, okay? We, we haven't put on a badge or anything of that nature, but um, how do you how do you deal with the the stress? And you know, thank goodness that you know you've been talking about mental health. But you know, when we were growing up, and I'm, I'm like 55 years older than you are, but mental health wasn't a, uh, as a big of an awareness issue in the military and law enforcement as it is today. So, 
How can people in our community really let the police know that, hey, man, we're there for you? Because you have a lot of people that look to take down the police. Yeah, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, there, it's it should be a good reminder that, you know, behind the badge is, is a person. Um, they have their own, you know, their own hopes, their own desires, their their fears, their insecurities. Uh, you know, you have some that will struggle financially, some that struggle in whatever it's marriage or, you know, issues raising their children. or Some of us food. Yeah, well, you know, not I, you, Chief. Me, I'm talking yeah, about. Well, that. no, but I mean, but you know, that was actually something that was a real issue for me. If you know, if we go back into um, 2020, 2021, um, I really struggled with that. I mean, I would, I, I ended up going through a program um, the Boulder, with the Boulder Crest Foundation. It was it's a nonprofit geared toward combat vets and first responders with critical incidents. Um, but coming into you know before I came into that, I was. You know, I'd eat McDonald's two, three times a day. I'd kill a box of donut sticks and drink six Cokes a day. I was over 260 pounds and um, not in a great – I was not in a healthy position. I mean I've lost, I've lost, you know, over 20 pounds. I still got – you know, I'd like to lose another 40, you know, like most people. But um, it was really going through working with Boulder Crest program and going through the Warrior Path program with them that – that was geared toward mental health and dealing with the things I had seen. You know, I, I was involved in an officer involved shooting as a trigger puller. I've had incident command of scenes where I've directed officers to engage in certain tactics that led to the death of somebody. Um, and, you know, dealing with that with my faith, uh, you know, was difficult. I've had, I had a friend, an academy classmate who was shot and killed a couple of years on the department. Um, and in 2021, I, responded to a shooting where we had um, one of our officers and two federal agents shot as part of a task force. And one of the federal agents shot on that train was a friend of mine who I had worked with a couple of years earlier doing the exact same work. And I'm stepping over his body on a train multiple times as we're trying to extract another federal agent off who had been critically wounded. And then having the suspect tell us he'd been shot and he wanted to surrender. And I sent a sergeant and officer myself. We went down to confront him to take him into custody and he ended up opening fire on us and um the sergeant i had on rifle shot and killed him um and you know that there was a point where i realized that i had become so emotionally turned off to pretty much everything like i didn't shed a tear with mike at his funeral and i was like this is this is a friend of mine um so i went through that program but i was coping through food um that's how i that's how i coped with it and coming out of that i i learned a lot about myself i learned um i learned tool i I gained tools that helped take care take care of myself um and during that time i was going through that program i had a friend of mine who had been on the department he'd retired from tucson um great guy he just after he got out he he couldn't get he couldn't get his feet under him he had he had several critical incidents had a canine killed um, he had been involved in a collision, a pedestrian had walked out in front of him at night while he was running uh, Code 3 lights and sirens, um, and he hit and killed a pedestrian. And, you know, uh, uh, there's several other critical incidents in his career, but he was working security um, one night, and it's while I was going through the program, and he shot and killed himself and left behind his wife and his, his children. And um, it really drove home the fact that we have men and women who dedicate their lives to serving the community, and they will spend the best years of their lives – um, serving the community and there's some that come out and they just they can't get their feet under I mean, th- this is true not just within law enforcement the military has the same issues um so so employee wellness is is very important for me i want officers i want our professional staff and our officers who engage in this work day in and day out to live happy and full lives um serve the community do it well and then when they're able to retire enjoy the retirement that they've earned so more coming up here on KIDO Talk Radio. Let's get you to work. Stay tuned on time. Brought to you by Beacon Park. Good morning, Kevin. From the G&G Installation Studio, bright sunshine on the windshield as you travel eastbound on the freeway, Chinna Boulevard, State Street. So be aware of that as you head into work this morning. Finishing cleanup of an accident near Eustick and Maple Grove. Watch for that. Shindig Farms Pumpkin Patch and Hay Maze is now open from wagon rides and zip lines to giant slides and corn cannons. It's perfect for the whole family. 
For pricing and hours, visit shindigfarms.com. That's your traffic now on KIDL. 580-5436-580-KIDL. Uh, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, uh, you being a, a veteran of law enforcement. When we take a look at uh, the increased dangers of law enforcement, and again, you've had the, the benefit of looking at our area objectively, uh, we are seeing more and more, and more officer-involved shootings, it's certainly not like Tucson, but we are seeing more and more dangers to the, the, to the police. What do you make of that? You know, I think a lot of it came out of there, 2020, COVID, um, George Floyd. All those things were set so – they were so unique in our time. And this is coming out – you know, and, and if you think about Michael Brown – and the incidents that flew from there and a lot of the protests and really the drive and a lot of anti-police sentiment. Hands up, don't shoot. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it it created a, a world where it was almost acceptable to be confrontational to police. And it, it's not that, you know, it, uh, we're not talking about the First Amendment right to protest the police. We're talking about being physically, uh, physically resisting and fighting the police. Um, so I think that it's almost be- become okay to 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 fight against police. So I, I think that that's why we you know we've seen these increases. And again, this is this is anecdotal. I don't I don't have a whole lot to I don't have any data to back it up other than my twenty plus years in law enforcement. Um, and I think the other thing too is a lot of people are paying more attention to police use of force than they had in the past. Um, which is which can be a good thing, uh, you know. It really has forced the profession to grow in the last um, several years and evolve. Uh, so, it, you know, that's that's where I take it as, you know, what tools, what training can we give our officers to try to mitigate those um, those incidents? Try to you know de-escalate where appropriate, and when force has to be used, what tools do the officers have that they can use force and take somebody into custody? And not have to use deadly force, you know, because obviously deadly force is the, you know, is the last resort option. And we want to m- mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, you know, our the police, go- the goal of the police department isn't to kill the suspects, take the suspect into custody and let them stand trial in front of a jury of their peers. That That is the that is the goal. So, you know. We 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 there was a lot that I was involved with with the, as a, the advanced officer the advanced officer training commander in Tucson when it came to that is we started looking at de-escalation and how we were going to increase the training reps and capacity for the department, looking at additional tools that we could bring on board, <clears throat> whether it was, you know, making sure everybody's equipped with tasers and deployment of less lethal munitions like the 40 millimeter foam, foam baton launcher, stuff along those lines. So uh, it's something that, uh, I'll obviously bring to the city of Boise is evaluating the training program. And, and the nice part is what, what I've seen of the training program and what's been offered, what's offered here now is the department is definitely in line with, uh, national best practices. The training they're offering, the tools that the officers are being supplied with, um, are, are really good in that regard. Uh, and it's, you know, constantly, you know, want to be constantly learning and evolving. And any time we have incidents, we want to learn from those incidents. What could we do better to try to avoid a certain outcome? Um, and it's not that the officers did anything wrong in that outcome. It was, hey, what what happened there and what can we learn from it? And can we be better? Is it a challenge to get people, young people into law enforcement these days? Yeah, I, I, absolutely it is. And we've seen this trend across the country. Um I, I think there's a lot of people who had may have traditionally considered law enforcement or thought it was an option who looked at it now and said, "Why well, don't want to be the next YouTube YouTube sensation that's a, you know being blown up across the country," um, which I think which I think is fair. So, you know, it's going to come down to, and I, I think in law enforcement we can help. We should be pushing out the great work that officers do. It's we're so. We're so often focused on the the negative when something goes wrong, something doesn't go the way we want it to go, as opposed to how many times it goes right, how many times, you know, everything was by the numbers, everything went right, and the officers were fantastic, and they revol- resolved the situation with no force or minimal force used, because it's so easy to focus on, on the extremes. Um, and the fact of the matter is, police departments across the country rarely use force. If you think about the amount of contacts police have... Um, 
every day if you think about how many times people are arrested and how and really how infrequent force is used the number is quite it can be quite shocking um i remember looking at um we were looking at some numbers and you know in the span of and i want to say it was around a calendar year in tucson this was this was back in about 2019 2020 um, when I was looking, we were, and I was in, I was in training at the time. I actually might have been a little earlier than that, but I was in training and, uh, over the train division and we had, the department had affected over 40,000 arrests. And in that same period of time, officers had used only four, had only used four 700, around 700 times. And deadly force had only been used like five or six times. So if you think about the number of people that are taken into custody versus, how often deadly force was used. And the majority of force used by officers are takedowns. They're hard takedowns, but not even punches being delivered. It's grabbing somebody who's actively resisting, um, forcing them to the ground, and physically forcing them into handcuffs um, because they're actively resisting. That's the majority of the force that officers use. So when you're talking about deployment of tasers and 40-millimeter munitions or pepper spray or canines, those numbers are are pretty small in the in the whole in the whole grouping of use of force. Um, so those are things I think we need to talk about to really give people an understanding of exactly when officers are using force. Let's go to the phones. Brian in Nampa for Chief Tennyson on KIDO Talk Radio. Good morning, Brian. Morning, Kevin. Morning, Chief. Uh, welcome to Idaho. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about something you talked about a little bit earlier. And, you know, some I, I've worked in a prison as a prison guard. I've got multiple family that's been sheriffs or sheriff's deputies. What got you through the loss of your friends and officers, if you could go a little bit more into detail and just give the public a little bit better idea of what that's like and what got you through it? Yeah, Um so unfortunately for me, for a lot of a big period of it, the coping was the food. It was quiet, um, sleeping my weekends away, you know, really withdrawn. Um, what's really changed my perspective in going through Warrior Path of Boulder Crest Foundation, it was, um, there was some, there was some things that came out. It was simple things. It was, you know, working out. It was, it was, you know, getting up in the morning and doing something. Even if my workout wasn't great, it, I got up and I did something, moving my body in a positive way. Um, it was the simple things of gratitude. Uh, you know, what am I thankful for each day? And working on that mindset of, instead of being sucked down into, um, kind of an abyss, I got into stoicism, uh, you know, reading Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and some of their, their views and philosophies in the world. That was, that was been really helpful. Um, and it was interesting going through, uh, Boulder Crest. They talked about one of the things they talked about was meditation, specifically transcendental meditation. I remember hearing about it going, there is no way I'm going to be a meditation guy. That is that is not me. Um, but I went through the training for it and I did the meditation. And I can tell you that was huge. And I still meditate twice a day. It's 20 minutes twice a day um, dedicated for my mental health. Um, and then probably the biggest thing is disclosure. It's actually opening up and talking about the things that affected you and having that, those five to seven people in your world that you can disclose things to and talk about things and get it off your chest as opposed to just carrying it around. You know, the, the, um, the folks Boulder Crest describe it as a rucksack and you're constantly loading it up with stuff with just rocks that are just weighing you down and getting that off your chest and talking about it is probably one of the is one of the biggest benefits. So th- those are some of the, the techniques that have really helped get me through some of the trauma. You know, I can tell you my daughter, after I got back two months after I got back from Boulder Crush, said it was like having a new daddy. Um, cause I was so much more engaged in my family and in my life. Uh, and that's something, you know, I strive for every day and I, I want to make sure anybody who's in the profession that if I can help get them there, I want to get them there. Thanks chief. I, I don't think we talk about that enough. And, what what it takes to get past that stuff. I mean, there's a lot of negativity on police and military, but uh, I can tell you that uh, we just don't deal with that enough and open up about it. And I appreciate your openness and wish you the best luck. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. More coming up next. Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. 
Our great friend Lars Larson joining us. Lars, great to have you with us. Good to be with you, Kevin, and thanks very much. And I appreciate all the emails and the calls I get from people in the Treasure Valley. No, your show is blowing up here. And, um, again, it's live, it's uh, regional, it's national, it's everything that we are. And whatever we want to say about Lars, you're a real person, bro, and we appreciate uh, the insight that, and passion you bring every day. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Kevin. I appreciate that, too. I mean, we... Uh, we have a good time, but we try to alert people to the dangers that are that are facing this country, and they are manifold. Can I tell you one that <clears throat> I hope never happens in Idaho, but it's just we've identified in the last few days happening in Oregon, and it could happen in your area. So if I mentioned DEI to you, you'd say, oh, yeah, I know the disaster. It's been a disaster for the U.S. military. It was a disaster in a very public way for Anheuser-Busch when they brought out those freaky ads to try to sell beer with the transgender Dylan Mulvaney. It's been a disaster for Boeing, which embraced what they called global DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know sometimes we use that term without explaining it. The bottom line of it is that you want, uh, DEI wants you to hire people not based on their skills, talents, and abilities, but based on their gender, either real or perceived, what they think they're, they're a girl or a boy, a uh, man or woman. And they want you to hire people based on that instead of just skills and abilities, or as Dr. King would have said, uh, the content of your character. And, uh, and the result of it is disastrous. You have Boeing with airplanes that have parts falling off in midair, and now they're in the middle of a strike. And who knows? I, I don't know the future of that company. It could be dire right now. You've got the U.S. military that can't recruit enough people to even fill its ranks and I think is considerably less effective as a military because they focused on DEI. So here's what we found out happened about two months, two and a half months ago in Oregon, right in the middle of the state's worst forest fire season in history. Now, this is a state where for 30 years, they didn't have a fire bigger than 10. They had one fire bigger than 10,000 acres. And the rest of the years, all little teeny fires all put out quickly because you're safeguarding the public's assets, these forests. And uh, so now we're at a point where half a million acres burn every single year. That's the average. Uh, this year, we've seen over one and a half million, three times that number uh, acres of forest go up in flames. And right in the middle of that fire season, the number two guy at the Department of Forestry was sent home, suspended with pay, and told not to have any contact with the office. Now, you'd think, what did he do? Did he, did he shoot somebody? Did he assault somebody? Nope. There were multiple complaints from the forestry departments, and this sounds almost silly to say it, their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy officer had filed complaints, and she literally said he's focusing too much when, he, when people are hired for the Department of Forestry. He's focusing too much. He is, quote, seeking only the candidates most qualified for the jobs. Now, I know that some of your listeners are going to hear that and say, well, I'm a minor boss. I hire people now and then. I do hire the best people quali most qualified for the job. She said that what, they sh what he should have been focusing on was gender and gender identity and including those people, even if they weren't qualified for the job. And Mike Shaw, the you know, deputy director of the State Department of Forestry, who's been there for a long time, uh, but he's not an old fogey. I mean, he's younger than I am. And uh, he, he was the guy in charge of the state's forest fire response, and they, they effectively fired him. They put him at home on paid leave, but I have a feeling they'll be sending him a, you know, they'll be ending his tenure at Department of Forestry, which is wrong. But because he hired the people most qualified for the job, and I'm quoting from one of the complaints filed by this Megan Doniker. Now, all I'm trying to warn you about is that as I said, it is not hard at all for you and I to have a very quick list that you can cite you know, from memory of all the big and small disasters of DEI. And most people, I think, may hear that and say, well, you know, I don't make airplanes. I, I might fly on them occasionally as a passenger, but okay, does this affect me? I'm not an astronaut who got stuck for months in space because of the failure of a Boeing spacecraft, which embraced DEI. If you live in a state that's full of trees, as Idaho, Oregon, and Washington are, and those trees are owned, most of them are owned by the public, not by private entities. Private ownership is smaller than public ownership, both federal and state. 
And you say, so the people in charge of making sure the forests don't burn or burn my house down or kill me because we've had deadly fires in this region before, they're going to hire people not based on skills and abilities, but based on whether or not they identify as male or female, can't even figure out their own gender, but they're going to be in responsible positions. Yes, that's what they're doing. And I want people to think about that when they start marking their ballots, that this this is about destroying. And this isn't just, you know, uh, some philosophical question. If your home is near forests that catch fire and they're not put out as effectively because we're not hiring the best people because we have to bow down at the altar of DEI, your life could literally be at risk. Your most, uh, your most valuable possession, one most people have that's most valuable, is your home and everything inside of it. And all the things you cherish, including, most importantly, your family members, may go up in flames because of DEI. That's where this thing, where the rubber really meets the road on this thing. So sorry to hit you with that, but if you start hearing that Boise State is pushing DEI or State of Idaho is pushing DEI, be forewarned. This is one where we can actually see the effect and say you put the guy in charge of forest fire response on leave in the early part of August as the state was in its worst fire season in history. The ones you can't see are the ones within various state and city and county agencies where they hire people based on DEI, and they're just not very good at whatever it is they're hired to do. It could be sewer and water. It could be roads. It could be all the other things that government is expected to do for all these taxes that we pay. And you say, and we're going we're gonna to make those agencies less effective? Because there is no way in the world that hiring people based on DEI makes an agency more effective. And I'll point something else out that really should be the first consideration. Kevin, you know that I have three producers. They all work for me. I pay them out of my pocket. That's the, this tiny business I run, three employees. The law makes it strictly illegal for me to hire or fail to hire somebody based on what's between their legs, the color of their skin, or what gender they might imagine they might be. It's illegal. I can't say I'm hiring you because you're black. I'm hiring you because you're a man who thinks he's a woman. I'm hiring you because you're a man or because you're a woman. And I have both male and female employees. Um, It's illegal for me to discriminate on that basis, yet DEI insists that you discriminate on that basis. Now, Kevin, my, you, you know in my, your audience knows that if you don't get the hook out, you're going to just have me run off at the mouth forever. But that's a real concern, and people should know what a risk that poses. And I know that Idaho tends to be more sensible than the states of Oregon and Washington, but watch for it because it's creeping in everywhere. Lars, please hang on. More with our friend Lars Larson next. Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. joins us now. So, Lars, we got the big race coming. It's coming yeah. down to the, uh, the, the end of the line, if you will, and it's a toss-up. Are you surprised? Uh, no, I'm not surprised. Actually, what surprises me more, and, and if I, you know, forgive me for faulting you, I don't think it's a toss-up. I don't think it's going to be close. I, I think that they're going to cheat. Apparently, Speaker Mike Johnson has already said, expect that there will be non-citizens voting in the election. Can you imagine anybody saying such a thing? But if he's just being honest and, and warning us of what's coming, and you've got, uh, you've got every player on the Democrat side, and I know people hear this, and all they think is it's, uh, oh, Democrats versus Republicans. There really is a different point of view. Republicans want every single citizen to be able to vote, and we want all of those votes to be counted accurately. Nothing wrong with that. The Democrats, and the Biden administration in particular, has gone to court after states that have had the temerity to say, we're removing illegal voters from our voter rolls. And the Biden administration has sued states saying, no, you can't. You can't remove those illegal voters from the rolls. Oregon got caught recently with 1,500 non-citizen voters on his voter rolls. And let me tell you something. You say, well, they, they caught that. No, they didn't. A think tank out of Chicago, it happened to be a liberal think tank, had, had made a public records request that forced the state of Oregon to look at its voter rolls. And what this liberal think tank uh, wanted to know was 
whether or not – they wanted to know because the state of Oregon has said we're going to start giving driver's licenses to illegal aliens. And that was one law. Then they had another law that said everybody who gets a driver's license gets signed up to vote. And this liberal think tank was wondering, well, if you're giving a driver's license to both citizens and non-citizens and you're signing up all driver's license holders to vote, how do you keep the non-citizens out of the voter rolls? Oregon took a look at its records where they had never looked before and found right away 900 non-citizens. And they said, oh, that's, that's all of them. And then some more inquiries were made, and they looked again, and they found another 300. And they said, okay, that's it. We found them all. That's 1,200 or so. And then a local newspaper that's won a Pulitzer Prize for its reporting said to the state of Oregon, you're counting American Samoans as citizens. And you know, Kevin, American Samoans are not citizens. They can become citizens, but they're not citizens automatically, and you're signing them up to vote. That's another 300 illegal voters. So in total, they found 1,500 illegal voters. Now, a few of them, a very small number, were green card holders who are non-citizens. And, but the vast majority were people who went into DMV, presented a foreign passport or a foreign birth certificate. Now, Kevin, do you know a better way to determine if somebody is a citizen of the United States than when they present a foreign birth certificate or a foreign passport and no green card? Even a green card will only tell you you're legally here in the United States and someday you could become a citizen, but you're not one right now. And, and they signed them up to vote. And so, and that's just the state of Oregon. Uh, Arizona is looking at illegal voters. So you have the Democrats arguing in court, you must leave the non-citizen voters on the rolls. And Warnock, this joker from Georgia, is arguing that hand counting of ballots at the precincts makes the election less accurate. I'm not joking. He, we've got a soundbite of him saying it. He said, we've found that if you know, when, when you have a, a polling vote on, on election day where somebody walks into the polls, gets a ballot, marks it, and hands it in, they want them to hand the state of Georgia passed law saying you have to hand count them at the precinct. Now, you may also electronically count them later on. But if you get a hand count at the precinct that shows, you know, 900 votes, but then later on the numbers show 1,200 votes, how will you ever know if the electronic system is telling you it's 1,200 votes if you didn't hand count them at the, at the polling place first? And Warnock is arguing hand counting of ballots, doing them one by one, is less accurate. Now, does that make any sense to you at all? Well, it makes sense to Warnock because he got in during the whole chaos in Georgia. So obviously yep. anything that helps Raphael Warnock and, and Lars, you know, I mean, for years and years, the state of Georgia was reliably conservative, reliably red, and now it's in flux. Although I, I think order is about ready to be restored in Georgia and a few, and a few other states. Yeah. And, and so what you've got is Democrats who become, uh, they have become accustomed to cheating. And now that they're cheating in, in many states that passed new laws after the 2020 election, the one that we were told was the most perfect election that had ever been held in American city, uh, history, you can go back and look at the comments people made from one side saying, oh, no, this was an absolutely flawless election. We've never had an election this accurate. And right away, about a dozen states passed new laws saying, here are all the things you can't do during an election. Now, Kevin, why do they pass laws that, that, that make certain things illegal right after the most perfect election in American history? Because it wasn't the most perfect election in American history. That makes sense? Um, yeah, it, it, it does. So if you're Harris, what, what's going on in your mind? I think she knows that she's losing. Uh, the joke on the Babylon Bee was Harris could win if she does not appear in public between now and Election Day. Because the more she has appeared, both she and Tim Walls, the worse it seems to get for them. And, well, it should, because people are finally figuring out, oh, that's what she's about? In the same way that Americans who were led to believe that uh, Joe Biden was sharp as a tack, to quote, uh, Kamala Harris, was completely on top of things for three and a half years when the Democrats, we now know, knew at the time he was not sharp as a tack. He was not on top of things. He was mentally failing the entire time. And I'd go back to the fall of 21 
where a number of Democrats went over to meet with the president at the, and this is the fall of the first year that he was president, and they went to meet with him about legislative issues and left that meeting and said, he doesn't know what's going on. And that was the fall of 21. It is now the fall of 24, three years later, and he's not any better. I mean, all of us who've had uh, friends or family members who are mentally failing know that there may, they may have flashes where they're you know, slightly more coherent or cogent, but, uh, but for the most part, it, it gets worse, not better. And they hid this fact. And I noticed the, the latest drumbeat has been Donald Trump needs to release his health records. I've got to tell you something, Kevin. Take a look at the schedule of that guy. And then watch. He was in Coachella, over California, over the weekend, had this massive rally. He gets up in front of these rallies and talks for an hour, uh, a little bit of it on the prompter, but, teleprompter, but most of it is off the cuff. And he's completely there. He answers questions from reporters. He does all this. And she's worried about his health records. And this is the woman who, for three and a half years, covered for a failing Joe Biden. It, she would have told you right up to the moment where they kicked him to the curb that he was completely mentally there, sharp as attack, et cetera, until they kicked him off the bus. And they did kick him off the bus. So we have Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama. This is the first time I think we've seen the entire Dem- Democratic team unified, with the exception of Joe Biden, to try to help her. She does seem to be losing steam, despite being, well, you know, having so much money and so much support from the media she's, and these she's politicians. She's losing black males to the point where Barack Obama was out trying to shame black males into voting for her because she's black. I mean, when it's convenient, if she's if she wants to be Indian instead of black, then she's that on on any other day. You know, and, and I think that's the big objection. People objected to Trump mentioning her racial background. Well, she's the one who chose to tout herself as I'm the first, you know, uh, East Indian uh, uh, American to to be a part of a nominee of a major party. And then all of a sudden, one day she goes from East Indian to no, I'm black now. Well, okay, which one is it? Well, it's what it's like Hillary Clinton with her baseball caps. In front of one audience, she wears a Mets cap. In front of another audience, she wears a Yankees cap. And you go, well, which one are you a fan of? Whichever one the crowd likes best. And that's one thing to do that with a ball cap. Although I think both you and I would think that's dishonest. I'm not that big a sports fan, but if somebody's wearing a Seahawks cap, it's because they back the Seahawks. They don't take that cap off and put on a different cap when they go to a different city. But she puts on different accents, different affects, different, you know, all the all this stuff. You can't tell what she is. But now that she's out in front of the public and you start asking her, well, hold on, are you you were for a ban on fracking absolutely for 12 years. Are you for that now? She won't even say it out loud. She has her staff come out and say, yeah, she's really not in favor of that anymore. Well, how about nationalized health care and making all the health plans that all of us are on right now, the private sector ones, illegal? Because that's what national health care requires. It requires that you make all private insurance illegal. Everybody is forced into a government uh, system. And with all due respect to the DMV in Idaho, I'm sure they're great. But can you imagine a government bureaucracy? If you think the hospitals and the, and the insurance companies are bad now, can you imagine trying to obtain your health coverage from a government bureaucracy? <laughs> think about the last time you had to go in for a permit or anything else dealing with the government where they know they are the only game in town. And if you want something, you, you have to go to them. Imagine if there was one grocery chain in Boise. You have to shop at Albertsons. Well, I'm not no, happy with their that, service. That's what's going to happen that. if that merger goes through, Lars. It may. It may, unless they're forced to, diver, to divest. But at least, you know, I've got, I, I think, five, six options. Tina and I go grocery shopping together, believe it or not. I am out there pushing the cart and, and all that. But, um, you know, we can go to Winco. We can go to Safeway. We can go to Freddy's, which is Kroger. We can go to uh, Walmart. We can, you know, I don't go to Target. Target's crazy. But, but uh, you know, I've got four or five different options. But imagine if you got your groceries at a government grocery store that ran, like, say, the DMV or the permit department in the Treasure Valley. I don't know. Maybe your permitting systems are better than the rest of the Northwest. But most of these jokers, when they know you want something done on your driver's license, you have one place to go, the DMV. If you're not happy with it, too bad. Sit down and shut up. Take a number. Because we are now imagine that for health care. Lars Larson, we always appreciate you, brother. 
hey, I run off at the mouth, but uh, you you can always put the hook on me. We always call that the content, so you're great. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Have a great week. You pre- we appreciate you. Thank you, Lars. Kevin Mill in the morning, brought to you by Beacon Plumbing. Stop freaking. Call Beacon. BeaconPlumbing.net. State Patriot, good morning. Boy, have I missed you. Let me tell you. Um, good morning, Mr. Miller, first of all. Let me well, just say we, that. We, we've missed you. Where have you been? <laughs> I've been the London City of Queen, you know. You've been uh, working uh, on your secret project. Yes. You know, it's nice to have you back in a driver's seat and steering us back down the road to conservatism. Um, so you made the top five but didn't take home the big prize. But I must say, you are the winner as far as uh, Idahoans are concerned that listen to you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your New York adventure. Uh, I know you were sheltered in the hotel because of all the security, but uh, did you get to see anything or tour the city at all? No, I, I really didn't. Uh, we were, you know, at the U.N., specifically at the U.N., so there was a lot of security. And as many of you know, I was fighting a cold, so I uh, did my very best. I went to – I didn't eat at Sparks, but one of the famous places that we walked outside of it and went to go see a comedy uh, club thing. And, again, I, I you know, I, I'm a bonehead. When I go somewhere, I work, and that's basically all I did was just work. And, you know, you have a travel day, two days, and then a travel day back, and when you're not feeling well, it's – Again, it it wasn't really, um, you know, a great experience, but it sure did make me appreciate Idaho. Well, it's a shame you missed Sparks. Used to be one of my favorite restaurants um, and great food. Let me tell you. Well, they have a dress code there. They have a dress code there, so (laughs) yeah, you can't wear a dress, right? Right. (laughs) Unless you're an actual lady. Uh, Apparently so. Yeah. You know, I have to say, you know, Lars is so right about the Forest Service, and we see it in our county. You know, we live in a wildfire area. And we'll tell you, to get anyone to answer any questions on when they're going to do something to mitigate the potential for forest fires in our community, it's like pulling teeth. And I know this because I've been involved in getting uh, answers to this question for over a year. And the current administration cheers on uh, and fosters LGBTQ acceptability along with their DEI movement. And if we challenge them, we're labeled racist. So uh, this is even though the quality of our governmental officials and even many of our corporate managers who have been uh, hired using BEI has been deteriorating literally for the past 16 years, ever since Obama came on the scene. You know, this is no way to run a country efficiently. And I only hope uh, that Trump cleans house uh, and has a mass firing for all of these incompetents when he... Uh, uh, gets in. Um, and I want to thank you for introducing a new police chief, but I have questions once again. Is this guy going to fit in with, uh, with the administration there as we saw what happened with the last police chief? And uh, I would say that the objectivity and capability of Mayor McLean has been questionable when it comes to staffing Boise police. Uh, the other thing that bothers me is that you know, Tucson is the fifth most liberal city in Arizona. So I guess that uh, this is one of the reasons that he got the job, as he has a background of dealing with the liberal uh, system politically. Uh, and it sounds like he knows what he's doing, but then again, time will tell. We only have 21 days to go to the election. And uh, I find it interesting that the DOJ is suing Virginia for taking non, non-citizens off the voter rolls. And it makes you wonder why our country is so screwed up. Well, these DEI hires is probably part of the problem. You know, Trump's, uh, he's winning in all the swing states, according to the most reliable polls, and the odds maker in Vegas are now betting on him winning. Um, and I have to say that the propaganda machine is working overtime, and they are still losing thanks to having a candidate who has no policies to fix the border or our economy. And all she talks about is the opportunity of the economy, but she has yet to define what that is or how it's going to work. So I have to say she is probably one of the dumbest people they could have picked to replace Biden. But then again, they were looking for somebody who is that dumb so she can be controlled. Um, Once again, nice to have you back, Kevin. Uh, Missed you a lot. Well, I am uh, glad to be back, and I missed you, little buddy. Well, 
Let's have a conversation later on today if you have some time. All right. Uh, thank you, Tea Party Bob, Kevin Miller, KIDO Talk Radio. Owns Craig joining us from Florida. Craig, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, well, we're good. You're in Florida. Tell us what's, what's going on, brother. All right. Well, I'm in a little town called Port Orange, Florida, which is right below, about six miles south of Daytona, Daytona Beach, Florida, which probably a lot of people know because of the of the NASCAR and all that. And, um, yeah, I just want to let you know, like, what we've seen on the ground. I live in a mobile home park, and basically my neighborhood is a war zone. There are trees down everywhere, fences down everywhere. A lady up the street from me, right on the same street I live on, actually lost her home. A big old tree came down flying uh, but, you know, fortunately for us in Florida, we have Ron DeSantis. So, you know, they, he had all the, he had all the electric people, you know, pre-stationed. So we got up, we lost our power, but got it on like in a day and a half, which was amazing. And, uh, there was about a, about a mile from me, there was another mobile home park where they were actually doing high water rescues from people because everything flooded and people were standing on top of their roofs trying to get out. It was amazing. It was, it, it was unbelievable. When that, storm, when that storm passed over us and then went out in Atlantic and it came back, the back end of that was way, that's where we got hit really bad. But uh, I'm a friend of Cowboy Calvin, so he asked me to call you guys and let you guys know what it, what's, what's it like on the ground here, over here in Florida. How um, you how did you make oh, it through? Yeah. How did you make it through, brother? Oh, I wrote it out. I wrote it out in my mobile home, and uh, I have roof damage. I have the skirt that goes around my mobile home got blown out, and I have. Uh, ins- all the insulation that's underneath my mobile home all got ripped out. You know, luckily I had, luckily the two palm trees that are in the back of my house are still standing because one of the walls went down, they, they were taken out my house. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, it gets to, it gets to a point where you're like, well, you know, I have a dog and it's like, you know, do I do I go to a shelter and uh, not to? You're always in that. You're always in that. You know, do you evacuate? Do you don't evacuate? And usually, by the time you say, "Yeah, I got to evacuate," it's too late, and the uh, roadways are all bump of the bump of traffic. People trying to get out, and you know, a lot of people don't realize. You know, when a, when one of these hurricanes comes from the Gulf side. And hits a uh, hits that Gulf side. No, it's only a three hour drive from from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's relatively a short distance. And these storms are so big. I mean, it was amazing. It was uh, the damage it did was. It reminded me of uh, a few years ago when we got hit with Hurricane Matthew. So, but like I said, I thank God we have Ron DeSantis. And I'm glad he didn't take that idiot's phone call. How are you doing? Um, how are you and your dog doing? Oh, I'm doing. I'm all, I'm all right. You know, uh, I'm originally from Massachusetts, so I'm used to storms. And uh, believe it or not, my dog slept through the whole thing. So, uh, but uh, it's just the af- the aftermath now is. Like I said, it looks my. It looks like a war zone here. Every in front of everybody's house, it's just a pile of debris. You know, in some cases, it's it's debris and stuff from people's homes because they flooded. Because because the flooding actually came. I'm about two and a half miles from the Atlantic Ocean, and the flooding actually came to the top of my street. So. It was amazing. It dumped, it dumped a lot of rain, a lot of rain, and uh, 
A lot of rain, a lot of wind. But uh, I was, my my trailer was rocking. I'll tell you that it was it was moving back and forth. Well, I'm glad. Crazy. Well, I'm glad you're okay, Craig. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to let. He asked me just to give you guys a, an update on like how us Floridians are doing. You know, is a the great the greatest thing about this is all the neighborhood. You know, we all get together. We all start helping each other out. We all, you know. <laughs> You know, if somebody needs food, we'll bring them food. You know, I'm a I'm a veteran of the 82nd Airborne Division. I uh, the person at the top of my street had a flag, had a Trump flag and a and an American flag that went down. I went over, I picked it up, and I folded the flag for him. Picked it up, put it on his porch for him. And you can't have the American flag on the ground. You're right. Sorry, just can't do that. You're right. And uh. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, it really shows the humanity of people because people you don't even know. Yep. I drove by a church and they had, you know, they had all these bottled water out there and food, free food, free bottled water. All you had to do, if you could get there and, and pick it up, if you couldn't, you know, somebody would go for you and get it. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, so well, it's really good to see, you know, and as far as the federal government, you know, state government-wise, you know, Ron DeSantis is awesome. Uh, he had, he pre-positioned, uh, like, you know, linemen and electricians all around the whole state prior to the storm. So I think as of Monday, we are, everybody in Florida has power now. Which was amazing. It, it is, Craig. Uh, why don't you call us back throughout the week? We'd love to hear from you. And uh, any friend of Cowboy Calvin's is a friend of ours. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll let you know, I'll let you know of any updates and anything going on. And oh. just let you know, FEMA is nowhere to be found. <laughs> by the way, <laughs> nowhere to be found. They they tell you to go to disassistance dot org dot gov. That's what they tell you to do. You know, it's like all right. <laughs> You sign up and you get on a list. But, yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Craig. God bless. All right. God bless you guys, too, out there. Have a great day. You, too. A Cowboy Calvin's friend, Craig. Mark, the watchdog of Eagle with Kevin Miller. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Kevin. I wanted to kind of follow up with what Lars Larson and Two Party Bob was talking about with DEI and, and the election and lying, fraud. You know, just some of the things I've been reading over the past few days here are CNN's Harry Eaton, uh, why are Democrats bedwetting? Harris doing considerably worse than Biden or Clinton by six points compared to 2020. I mean, there's one of them for you. You got a, a guy named uh, on the war room guest host Ben Harnell with Rasmussen pollster Mark Mitchell. Not looking good for Kamala. Between now and Election Day, she needs an act of God to win. So, you know, it just depends upon, I guess, where you want to get your news from and what you want to believe. So I tend to believe websites like this more than I do the alphabet networks, uh, especially after what we all face across this country with uh, COVID. Uh, you know, there's a group out there, StopBogusBallots.com, is starting to post a list of thousands of casted ballots from bogus addresses where voters could not have legally voted those ballots from. Uh, there's another one. Uh, now, now, Lars was talking about, what, 500 or 1,000, 1,500 illegal voters there in, in Oregon. <clears throat> well, how about this one? StopBogusBallots.com finds 2,848,288 likely fraudulent voter registrations in six swing states. Okay, and <laughs> that's far more than uh, 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 uh, so, you know, what does that kind of tell you? You know, and, and, and the other day there was one about the DOJ wants to sue uh, the Virginia government over enforcement of the 2006 law removing non-citizens from voter lists. Okay, now I'm going to tie this into DEI. When you put fraudulently somebody like Biden and Harris in power from the front of the 2020 elections, and like just like Obama, he purged the military. You put people in power, then you evoke uh, in, in top the Department of Justice, like Merrick Garland's a great example of a of a, a useful idiot. 
You put them in other, you put them in corporations, you put them in DOG, FBI, CIA. I've read articles here online, I've sent them to you about how the CIA, even the FBI, have DEI uh, working in their own agencies. You got it even in the internal revenue service. So when you put, all you have to do is put a couple of people, two or three people in positions of power within those types of agencies within our government, handed to you by the United Nations globalists out there, and the demon rat thugs uh, will be able to go hog wild with controlling the outcome. I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you were talking, Kevin. I'm sorry. We'll be able to control the outcome of things such as our election, like they did in 2020. Well, they won't. <clears throat> they won't, Mark. Thank you for the call. Dr. Harper joins us now on KIDO Talk Radio. Good morning, Dr. Harper. Hey, it's great to have you back, Kevin. Uh, to join you here on. I wanted to share a brief concern, actually a serious concern about Kamala Harris ignoring the, the, the plight of homeless veterans. I just recently learned that FEMA has $640 million allocated to uh, provide housing for illegal aliens, but only $70 million is allocated, according to the VA website, for homeless veterans. Well, we, we know the priorities of this administration. It's not the veterans. It's not the American people. It's... Joe Biden, it's Kamala Harris. You ever run into her in D.C. at all? Uh, well, I've only been with her close in in the hallway at the White House, two feet in front of her when she had that hyena laugh. What was that like? Oh, that was very disturbing. No, I mean she, when you see her, her, when you see her physically, uh, what goes on in your mind? And I mean, is she an impressive person, or what do you when you see her no. physically? No, like she doesn't belong there. It kind of reminds me of Obama when he was there. He looked like a, a you know, like a kid wearing a, a man's suit. Didn't fit him. Uh, it, <laughs> she doesn't wow. belong there. It's totally, it doesn't fit. She doesn't. Uh, she's so incompetent. I, I, uh, it's just putting it mildly, but um, you know, behavior. And I was there in the press room when Biden shows up in the James Brady press room. What was uh, what, did Biden? Years. You know, yeah, I know. Was he was he lost as well? Yeah, he's off his rocker. I mean, he, he slurred speech and so forth. But uh, and then he walks out saying that he's back in the race. <laughs> okay, Doctor Harper. Anything else you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, you know, just that that final comment. I just hope that uh, homeless veterans can get help. I'm an Air Force veteran. And I really, I'm really concerned about the plight of homeless veterans. So, well, we appreciate uh, again what you're what you're talking about, and uh, again, we thank you for your service, Doctor Harper, joining us, Kevin Rill in the morning at KIDO Talk Radio. A quick look at, um, you know, that Kamala Harris has problems with guys. I think the polling this morning and the week. I think David's right. It, it was a rough week. I mean, her faves are down. They're struggling with. I mean, the front page of the New York Times this morning. Front page story, Democrats struggling with African-American voters, particularly African-American men. This gender gap issue is real. It's a real problem, and you see the Democrats reacting to it. And I think what they are now filing in October of the election, coming to realize is that uh, a lot of men think Democrats care more about dudes who want to become women than dudes who just want to be dudes. Well, no. Dudes that want to become women, not just dudes. Scott Jennings from CNN on KIDO Talk Radio, he's, he's right about that. The Democrats, I what what have we heard throughout the the entire time here? Dudes that want to be women, not dudes. So is it a wonder why masculine dudes are not down with the Democratic Party? Care more about dudes who want to become women than dudes who just want to be dudes. Well, no. Dudes that want to become women than just dudes that want to be dudes. Toxic masculinity, the rise of femininity, the replacement theory it's all happening to right before our eyes is it a wonder why young men that see their opportunities disappearing young men that are vilified white black hispanic asian men it's jerry seinfeld alan alda uh everyone loves raymond on steroids and no, and no hunting cosplay or cringy videos is going to change it the bed is made the bed is made scott jennings <laughs> calling it out the bed is made i would say that by the way you know it's tough 
when your Bill Clinton, who I believe is still younger than Joe Biden, and he's at his favorite place to eat. Do you know what that is? McDonald's. So Bill Clinton comes up, and the lady thinks he's Joe Biden. Hi, I'm Bill Clinton. Oh, isn't that sweet? Are you going to get me a Diet Coke? Ah, okay, Kamala. Let's go to McDonald's and have a good time. I like that quarter pounder with cheese, although that's the worst thing that you can eat in your life. Yes, I know. Donald Trump eats a lot of that. Yeah, and he does that with a Diet Coke, too. Yes, I'm going to have a real Coke because I'm a real person. Hi, hey, how you doing? Uh, that's right. She thought that he was Joe Biden. Anybody at that level, anybody really at any level of success and in industry and in life, what is it? They're, um, they've got a big ego. They have an incredible ego. And can you imagine poor Bill Clinton thinking, thinking that he would be ever, ever confused with Joe Biden? Say what you want about Bill Clinton. He was elected twice. Joe Biden was elected once. So where do we go from here? Obviously, Clay and Buck. Obviously, Sean Hannity, Lars Larson. And uh, a note of thanks. Again, I want to thank the friends here at the Broadcast Center for redoing our entire work area, welcoming us home from New York. No, we didn't win, but we win every day as long as we have this forum together with each and every one of us. And if you're going through a tough challenge, whether it's mental health, whether it's physical health, whether it's emotional health, uh, just know that you're in my prayers. I pray for you each and every day. And obviously those people that are going through medical challenges as well and those professionals that take care of them, God bless you and God bless the servants because Christ tells us we all should serve. Good day. God bless. As always, keep the faith. And as always, K. Millie loves you. Beacon Plumbing brings you Fox News. Clay and Buck next.